that's the assumption I made on drafting the bill that the conditional mergers, which go away after July 1st if they are not acted upon, it seemed like that would be a better state of affairs for Huntington, and that if there was an intention to merge, the tools are there to do it without us treating Huntington in this bill or the other conditioned mergers. So with that said, welcome. And if you could just introduce yourself and, uh, and then tell us what you want us to hear. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Paul Susan, chair of the Franklin School Board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to H39. When I submitted the testimony, I was submitting the testimony, I think on Wednesday morning, waiting until the last moment, and, and crossed over your revision. Mm -hmm. So there's one sentence in paragraph three that I'm, when I get to it, I'm going to simply say it's irrelevant, it's not pertinent. And the rest of the testimony is, is okay. Um, and I'm, I'm going to just go through this quickly, and then I can answer questions. Does that work? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding H39. My name is Paul Susan, Chair of the Huntington School Board. To explain who we are and how we got to this point, the Huntington School District voted against merger in 2011, 2014, 2016, and 2018. Huntington School Board remains responsible, therefore, for the governance of the Brewster Pierce Memorial School in Huntington, grades pre-K to 4. Huntington students, grades 5 to 12, attend middle school and high school in the Mount Mansfield uh, Union uh, School District. MMNUSD, uh, we use the, the acronym. Chittenden East assesses Huntington for special ed transportation and administration. On November 28, 2018, as obviously you know, the State Board of Education ordered that Huntington School District be conditionally merged into the Mount Mansfield Unified School District, depending on a commingled vote worn by MMUSD of the five towns within Chittenden East and Huntington for July 1, 2019. Based on issues of process delegation constitutionality, the Huntington School District filed a legal challenge in December 2018, and I should say that's separate from the other two legal challenges that were, that were filed. We have one. The defendants included the State Board Agency of Ed, and due to the specific wording of the Secretary's order, and then MSD. Long before any thought was given to a legal challenge, and this really goes back to 2016 or so, we discussed significant obstacles regarding the timetable for a possible on merger, forced merger. Um, first, on town meeting day, the MMUSD budget was approved by Australian ballot. The separate Huntington School District budget was approved from the floor, so we've got two different budgets. Second, there is no provision, and this is important, there is no provision in the state board order for updating and revising the 2014, art, 2014 articles of agreement, which presumably would be the basis for a vote. Um, and, there's a, and there's a problem because some of those articles have already uh, expired. An example is school closure, which had a four-year window. Designation of school enrollment vis be residents, which only had a one-year window. Third, and this, and this really is an issue because of the petition from, that you heard about from Andrew Pond yesterday for unification, there's a serious question as to what happens if either a commingled vote fails, as that's occurred in Memorial North with Cambridge Elementary, or if the vote is not held by July 1 of 19. In both circumstances, the 2014 articles apply as written, Huntington would remain a non-member elementary school district, and that's what happened in 14, and that's what happened after the vote in 16 and 18. And if I could just interject, that is our understanding from the lawyers at AOE and our own lawyers that if a vote is not called by July 1st or if the vote fails, then Huntington would remain as they are now. It would remain part of modified union. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so we've got questions. We've got questions about the ambiguity of how budget gets consolidated, what role the electorate has in voting for a new consolidated budget, whether and how the articles of agreement are reviewed or negotiated, what happens in the event of both fails, which you just addressed. I would add to that also. There's a question that I have about whether that commingled vote is going to be by Australian ballot from the floor, and that's something that's going to have to be worked out. That could take some additional time. My next sentence is not relevant today because of your revision, is because there's not a possible one-year extension. So I'm not going to read that. And then there's this complex problem that the SU has in dissolving a supervisor union to school districts and creating another one. It's all going to take time. Obviously, that's my point. The Huntington School District has a voluntary stay with the state at the request of the state. And we agreed to it so that we could avoid legal filings back and forth until MMMUSD warns a vote of the court rules of the main argument, whichever occurs first. 
we do not know whether or when and then the USD is going to warn a vote or hold a vote, nor do we know how the timetable associated with the court's rulings affects any of this. If a commingled vote were to be held before July 1 of 19, and it were successful, Lincoln School District is going to move expeditiously to cooperate in this merger process. We have no interest in, in being an obstacle to a process if there's a vote before July 1 19. We'll do everything we can to make it happen and that would be smooth. However, given the concerns, the ambiguity, and unanswered questions expressed above, July 1, 19 appears to be a difficult deadline. I don't know if I can take out impossible, but difficult deadline to meet with integrity, with integrity, accuracy, and community inclusion. So I will leave it there. I anticipate probably if, some questions. If I might, so my my underlying assumption was first that Huntington did not want to merge. The votes in Huntington, the last vote was 60% against merger, 40% for merger. That being the case, my my assumption was that offering an extension, which would not be an extension to Huntington, but rather an extension to MMU of a year to consider uh, a vote to add you, would not be in your best interests. I think that's right. I think the extension what the extension does is it creates another year where all of us are in purgatory, yes. basically. Um, the tension and the conflict, um, Senator Harvey was at our meeting, we heard it, we feel that it's palpable. The tension within our community is palpable, the tension between the, the MMUSD board and our board, the tension between their communities and our communities. We're sending our kids 5 to 12 to their, their school district, and we ended up having a legal challenge against the school district. That is not Right, they're not, they're not about that. So another year in that situation is something that we don't want. Yes. Um, we would like to see a vote happen before July 1 of 19 so that either we have merger on July 1 19 or we have no merger. Well, you will have that, you will have that certainty on July 2nd. Uh, forevermore. Though. Yeah. Because when we, when we voted in 14 and in 16, when we voted in 14, we didn't realize because we went from 153 and 156 and 46 and 49. And then we voted again in 16 and we voted again in 18. So that would be our desire. Well, and as I say, with us doing nothing with you, you will have that on July 2nd. Either a vote will have been warned and won, or a vote will have been warned and lost, or no vote will have been warned, in which case the, case the conditional order goes away. So you're the reason why this doesn't address the conditional mergers, the four of them outstanding, is because on July 1, they will have certainty one way or the other. And the tools for determining how you move forward are, are I would say they're in your hands, but they're really in MMU's hands right now. Um, but so I thank you for uh, clarifying. It, it seems as though we took the right path in not, not giving an extension to MMU to um, questions for um, for the witness. Thank you, Paul, for coming. I appreciate that you made the trip. Um, I, I just I, I know you just got asked this question, but I just want to make sure on the record that you are comfortable with the draft as it now stands for H39, and you feel that it meets the needs of the Huntington. Comfortable, I'm comfortable with the H39 draft as it currently stands for Huntington, and I'm only for speaking. Right, I'm, yes. I'm, right, I'm only speaking for Huntington, not for any other school district. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you. Um, okay, I believe now we've shifted. So rather than Scott Thompson, I've been asked to have Mary Niles come up because of a. I appreciate it. You need to leave. I've got three kids yeah, yeah. with my attention in three different locations. Thank you so much. So I, um, there's a digital link that can be provided to our section nine. This is just the cover letter that went along with it. And I, yes, I believe she can provide you that digital link mm -hmm. to our pretty substantial section nine. Um, this is testimony. Excuse me. 
Yes. <laughs> chairs mean business. So, um, did anyone get a copy of this? I think so. All right. I appreciate the opportunity today. Thank you so much. Um, I am Mary Niles. I'm chair of the Montgomery School Board. Um, I want to make sure that it's known that my remarks today are mine alone. I am not speaking for the entirety of my school board, although we had a majority vote on our school board to join the lawsuit. So, but we are a divided mm -hmm. board, 3-2, or have been until our most recent election on Monday, where I think the balance has shifted a little more in favor of uh, maintaining our independent district status mm -hmm. and our involvement in the ongoing lawsuit. Um, so I'm struck by the magnitude of this moment for our community. Um, this has been a long few years for us, uh, as in this case in many of the communities. It's an odd deja vu. I'm sitting before another body tasked with making decisions um, that really kind of speak to the core of our community, our school, which we um, are so proud of. Um, there's an interesting paternalism at play here, whereby those in position of power are making decisions for our community. Outsiders deciding what is best for us regardless of our self-assessment and our wishes and the wishes of the majority of our electorate on two separate occasions now. This is an inherently top-down approach. It's part of what so many of us object, object to, the notion that somehow the directives of Act 46 supersede the outcome of legally warned votes. Is it not compelling to you, some of whom were likely instrumental in crafting and passing Act 46, that so many communities are in utter turmoil over forced merger? There's too much dissent and confusion to meet the July 1st, 2019 deadline. And I understand that this isn't the forum necessarily to relitigate Act 46. In a lot of ways, it's water under the bridge. But it feels really important, because I haven't spoken to you all. I've spoken to the SBE, the yeah. Secretary of Education, the AOE, but not this body. So as you prepare to weigh the merits of delay, please consider the following. First and foremost, the delay which will be most efficacious for us is a no-strings-attached clean delay until July 2020. This allows the court process to unfold. It's a complex case involving over 30 plaintiffs, and while the preliminary injunction was not issued, the case must still have its merits heard by the court. All signs point toward this ending at the Supreme Court. The delay will afford districts time to accept the court's decision and work toward honoring it. The delay spares organizational and consolidation efforts, most notably the sale and acquisition of school properties, the commingling of assets and debts, and the merging of budgets, which would then need to be entangled should the lawsuit prevail. Unpacking merged boards, budgets, assets, and debts would be far more onerous and cumbersome than a one-year delay. I've yet to receive a single directive as to the legal process by which our multi-million dollar building is quote unquote sold to the newly merged district for $1. We have not had time to consult with counsel as to how exactly this will work, and there's little clarity around who has the authority to authorize this sale in the first place. We need time to understand how to proceed in re with regard to property transfer, and doing this under duress seems careless. And just as a side note to that, I've spoken with the chair of our select board, and there's major confusion on the town level about who actually owns our school property. Actually, it's the state. Well, the, there's no deed that we've been able to, to produce yet that shows whether it's the town of Montgomery or the, or the school district. Well, the district's assets are owned by the state. OK. So that should be um, put on the table. OK. I think people have a very proprietary sense of their school building. The state doesn't have any desire to assert ownership over it, but that's the legal state of it. Okay, we have had lawyer, uh, the lawyer for the town suggest otherwise, but again, that is way above yep. my pay grade when we start looking into the deeds and property and how this yep. property transfers. And as works. I say, the, the state typically doesn't want to step in and act as though I see. they are the owner of the building because we have delegated to the districts all of the duties and people pay their taxes, people work on their buildings, they have a sense of ownership in them, and that's great. But, but at the end of the day, when push comes to shove legally, it is the state's asset. 
Um, so I, I hear you that it's a complicated issue, but I want to just give you that. That's straight from our legislative council team in terms of huh. what, the, what the state of affairs is. Okay. Well, moving on then. Bearing in mind the many unknowns surrounding force mergers, we serve Montgomery's children best to honor the will of our electorate if we can delay a merger until 2020. A sea of complexities exists with or without, such as the nature of education in the era of Act 46. Montgomery passed its FY 1920 budget at our annual meeting just on March 11th without one dissenting vote. There's no risk that delay impacts our ability to run our school to the highest of standards as we've been doing for years. So while Emily Simmons resorts to fear mongering and the AOE's continued push of the consolidation agenda, rest assured the Montgomery School District is on solid footing doing what we do best, educating our children at a high performing, fiscally savvy school with a deeply invested and engaged board, administration, teaching and support staff and community. The prudent path would be one of thoughtfulness and caution to err on the side of allowing more time to sort out the legal and logistical complexities, not less. Please think deeply about the real, tangible benefits of the delay as they far outweigh any of the drawbacks. Please don't muddy the waters by establishing requirements in order to qualify for this respite. Why complicate this further with tying the delay to ratifying merged boards? Why hold small school grants hostage when our school relies on this funding? Without it, we have to make serious sacrifices and ultimately kids are most impacted. Why does this process have to be so punitive? It's cruel politicking and immensely discouraging. I understand the overarching trends which prompted the development, passage, and implementation of Act 46. The goals of providing quality, equitable education at a palatable price point for taxpayers are laudable. The tactic of consolidation and forced merger is not. We've maintained all along that our thriving school is not subject to the demographic and economic forces which, which precipitated Act 46. And I would really encourage you to take the time to read our Section 9. Montgomery has been highlighted in numerous articles over the last men, decade plus as to our kind of level of success that we achieve even with a 50% free and reduced lunch population living at or below the poverty level. We meet the needs of our kids beautifully and our families were very responsive to that, to our community. You know, so I'll maybe leave it at that because I understand again, not the time to relitigate the Act 46. There's more here in this testimony as well as the follow-up letter that I wrote to the SBE after we delivered that testimony last July over in New York. What has been slightly demoralizing is how many times we've kind of come before various boards and individuals in this process and felt somewhat silenced. Not many people even can find Montgomery on a map. We're a little out of sight, out of mind. We have had an incredibly strong um, argument around geographical isolation that has just been met with kind of utter kind of just being ignored um, in uh, the affidavit I just wrote as part of the lawsuit, follow up to the corrected, the defendant's corrected reply from the initial kind of proceedings of the case. I talk more in depth about this geographical isolation point, and it's written in here as well. You know, this idea when they're looking at our school, suggesting that from border, that border to border, these kind of metrics that are rather meaningless in the winter and the mud season for us up there, because they are not at all a reflection of our lived experience on the daily. The same way who's ever gone to Los Angeles, you can spend an hour trying to drive five miles in that city. It's staggering. Mm -hmm. I was out there for some college tours with one of my kids. It was stunning. And it's the same way. It can take me you know, 45 minutes mm -hmm. from where I live on the back of the mountain to get to Sheldon, which has now been brought into not only our SU, but into the newly merged NMVU district. And just to clarify on, on the small school grants, so the State Board of Education redid the criteria for small school grants. There's a 16-point scale, so it's geographic isolation is one half, 
and the other half is excellence in instruction. And each year, districts that, that qualify would have to apply and they'd be ranked in those things. What this bill says is if you do manage to become operational by July 1st of this year, you don't have to go through that process each year. You would, going forward, you would automatically get your small school grants. So it's not that people who take a delay won't get their small school grants. They will have to demonstrate their excellence in instruction each year. So you're not getting any more money or any less money whether you take the delay. It's just easier on the district. Um, sure. And we qualified this year we're yep. very high in the kind of ranking both from the yep. geographical isolation angle as well as the kind of excellence uh, side of, of, of it. And um, you know for me it doesn't feel and for us it doesn't feel burdensome to, can, to have to reapply for okay. our small okay. schools grants because I trust then you'll be fine. I categorically yeah. trust that we yeah. will continue to qualify based on not only the metrics of geographical isolation but mm -hmm. of excellence and if, if I could speak to the um, to the no strings or the clean idea because I assume other people will make the same argument I'll just give you my opinion because the committee has yet to vote on this bill but the way I view it is um, there are plenty of people and plenty of people in educational institutions, for instance, including the Agency of Education, the superintendents, other people, as well as individual boards. Uh, if you look at that map behind you, everybody in orange has already satisfied Act 46. If you go to those uh, districts, they will argue, many of them, that we shouldn't allow any delay that this is just creating chaos, so we should, their way of looking at it is rip the Band-Aid off now. I didn't agree with that, and so I tried to think of a way to get everybody in gray who needed it a delay, but how can we satisfy the two communities at once? How can we satisfy the Act 46 uh, impulses at the same time that we're allowing that to go forward? So the draft that that we have in front of us says AOE is requiring by July 1st that everybody go through about 10 steps and become operational on July 1st. This draft says you only have to go through the first two of those and ask for a delay. So this is much less onerous than what AOE is requiring, but it is requiring something of districts. And I hear you saying you wish it weren't. But it's an attempt to give you what you need, which is a year during which the case may resolve itself or may become clearer, but still in all, you'll have another year to be readier if you have to merge. So it's admittedly, I wouldn't view it as a delay with strings, but rather there's a process that's in place that we are shortening for you. In other words, instead of having to take 10 steps by July, you have to take two, and then you get a year off. So, I, I, can you clarify for me yeah. what those two yes. steps are? Are then so if if your community has yet to form a transitional board, and I'm guessing you probably you have. So we're in a unique situation where the where Bakersfield and Berkshire have been operational since November of 2017. They yep. voted yes for merger. Montgomery was considered advisable. Sheldon wasn't even on that ballot, which presents a kind of interesting angle because Sheldon was thrust in by the AOE and then uh, subsequently by the SBE decision, but they actually were never on that initial ballot. Passed. So there's the four communities. Yes. Have you created a transitional board with members from each of the four communities? No. Okay, so that would be the first step. They are organizational, though. Their board is the Bakersfield Berkshire NMVU, Northern Mountain Valley Union Board, is considered operational. Right, but if, if they're under a state board order now to merge into the four districts. Right. So, so maybe the way it will work is they will send representatives from their merged district. And then uh, Montgomery and Sheldon will send representatives from theirs. And the way it works in the default articles is the president of the school board, uh, or the head of the school board, chair, whatever you call them, and your clerk automatically sit on this transitional board. So 
So let's say in your case there would be six or eight. It's two members from every town. Yes. With it's not proportional to town population. Right. And so it would be eight. Let's yeah. Say. So that transitional board of eight forms, and they warn an actual election in the four communities to elect a merged board, a first merged board. We call it the initial board. So you have a warning. You have people campaign for seats. And some of them may campaign as being against Act 46. I don't care. Some may, may campaign saying, I'm going to get on the board and immediately vote to take the delay, and then we're going to table all other action. That doesn't matter to me either. In order to get the delay, all you have to do is elect that first board, and that's the, the, the board that's empowered to ask for the delay and get it. And at that point, you can do nothing until the case resolves, because you won't have to come up with a merged budget. You'll have a year where you can still have individual budgets for your towns. Right, and I understand that. I think the concern is that once that transitional board has legal authority, or you mean or the, the initial the, board. Yes, the yeah. initial board, the new the board for the newly merged yep. district has legal authority. One, the possibility exists that they would not, you know, that it would not be a unanimous vote toward delay. It could potentially be split. I can't know what Sheldon's two representatives, nor what the Montgomery representatives, I think, I believe I will likely be one of them on that board, how that vote would go down. So it's possible that it would not be in favor of a delay, which then, again, kind of puts M Montgomery in this situation where we're having to proceed with merged board uh, activity the, and while we wait to see how the lawsuit unfolds. I mean, I think that's the kind of the, cha the challenge and why mm -hmm. that part of this slightly amended kind of pared down, it's not 10 must-dos, it's only two, that's still a pretty consequential must-do that wouldn't necessarily guarantee the outcome that we would prefer. Well, and the other thing, just two things about the, the, the legal process. So when Judge Mello decided that there was no need for a preliminary injunction, what he decided was that going forward would not be an irreparable harm to your district. That's his, as a Superior Court judge, that's what he decided. And his logic is that by the time the decision gets handed down, there will not be enough intermingling that you couldn't untangle. So let's let's take what I asked you to, to do, or the community, what the draft asks. It asks you to elect this initial board. Let's say June 1st, a judge, Judge Mello, rules that in fact he looked at it again, and in spite of his preliminary uh, ruling, which seemed to favor the state, he finds that your argument is compelling, and Act 46 should go away. Let's, let's say he ruled that way. At that point, all you have to do is disband that initial board. They take a vote to disband. And you're right back where you are now. So you mean to say that we won't have had to initiate the property, these property transfers, this no. commingling of well, debt so, and so assets? If, if you ask me what would make sense, and what, what I might do from where I sit, I think it would, it would, knowing that you're going to have to merge at some point anyway, I think it would be prudent to not stop with your initial board, but have them explore creating your first budget, your first merged budget. And then, if the ruling goes against you, you've got a budget that you're working with. But that's not required under this draft. The only thing that's required is that that initial board meet and take a vote on whether to delay. That's as far as this draft extends. And some other places are kind of doing a parallel thing. So in case, you know, so you're prepared in case right. one thing happens or in case the other thing happens. Well, which is why we went ahead as a board and a town and, you know, and warned our budget that was voted on on May. We know that we have a fully funded, you know, $2.7 million budget for Mon just for the Montgomery School District, you know, as of Monday when that vote was successful. So, Ma'am, I, I, I'm enjoying talking to you, but we have a room full of Understood. people. Understood. I appreciate Anything your time. Anything you want to say to finish up? I mean, I'm struck. I mean, it's so interesting. I understand there's kind of legal 
stuff around what Judge Mello's decision and this irreparable harm. It's so interesting to think that what I think gets missed in that legal analysis of irreparable harm is that he, he and a lot we feel, a lot of people aren't haven't seen on the ground the harm that is actively being done in our community around merger, the divisiveness, the fracture, the stress. And it's a really, it's an emotional situation for us to be in because as we've presented over and over and over again that the mandates of Act 46 Montgomery is meeting them beautifully. We still go back and says, I know we can't relitigate Act 46, but I still, Mm -hmm. I am harping on the fact that we do not feel as though we were heard from the outset. Mm -hmm. I mean, our school is phenomenal. We don't necessarily see the ways in which this merger actually helps us get improved significantly. And we see uh, the harm tax-wise, the debt burden that we are going to uh, incur as a now emerged community. Sheldon just voted a $1.7 million bond and it puts us in the position we either inherit their decrepit building owing to years of deferred maintenance or now we inherit this $1.7 million bond. Montgomery brings the least amount of debt to this equation. We have funded our school so smartly for decades now. So again, I know there are probably way more uh, kind of legal arguments around this irreparable harm. And if that's the threshold, I understand that that's a little bit above my pay grade. But what I see on the ground is Montgomery is a community that has been asking endlessly for people to hear us, to see us, to acknowledge what we're doing, how well we're doing, and essentially leave us alone. We get it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Andy Davis. Brattleboro. Brattleboro. Okay. It's a big state. It's a big state, but we found our way out here. So, Andy's out. Uh, Hi, I'm going to take a moment to get organized here and take a deep breath. Well, good afternoon. My name is Andy Davis. I live in Brattleboro, Vermont. I'm a recently elected member of the Brattleboro Town School Board, which has become a complicated thing to explain to people because we don't know how long this board will be will function. But running for it was a great experience, and I think it revealed something about where we are with Act 46 in our community. I'll go into that in a minute. Um, I'm a town meeting rep. You're familiar with Brattleboro's unique form of representative town meeting. Um, although I was elected to the town school board, I won't be sworn in until after March 23rd because we don't change select board or school board until after our representative town meeting, which is not till the 23rd of March. You all look puzzled, but that's is how it we different than your normal town meeting. Uh, we vote on on state March 5th. That's when I was elected, but I won't be sworn in until after representative town meeting. The 150 reps represent the voters of Brattleboro legally and make the decisions in place of an open town meeting. It's unique, but it serves us. Uh, for 32 years, I taught music in the public schools of Vermont and retired this past June 30th. I have two children very different, who went through Brattleboro Town Schools, kindergarten to grade 12. My daughter has Down syndrome. My son happened to be the valedictorian of his class, and I feel like our schools served both of them with distinction. We don't have broken schools, and we'll get back to that in a minute. We have a very functioning supervisory union, and that's really a key piece of information in some of the previous uh, witness, uh, I found myself resonating with a lot of her testimony. Um, I'm a little disappointed when I hear people characterize those of us that have questioned merger and forced merger as being anti-education or anti-school or um, 
In my experience, the people that this whole situation has brought me in contact with are well-researched, well-committed people who have spent years serving on boards, serving their community in various ways. We are not anti-school. We're very pro-school. We're very pro-education. We identify what's working and we want to preserve what's valued in our community. And no one in here has ever I know, but I hear that. I'm not accusing you all, but it's in the atmosphere. Yes. I, I promise you, it's in the atmosphere. I come today with a plea as well as a position, a call for help. The meetings, I, although I have not been sworn in, I've attended many school board meetings. And the meetings I attend these days are really focused on how do we maneuver? How do we hedge our bet? How do we design a two-pronged approach with July 1st, June 30th, different rules coming down, legislative changes, et cetera. The board in Brattleboro is now trying to find a path that will both follow the law and the will of the community. It's sort of been described as a kind of two-pronged approach to prepare for both situations. Recently, we had a postponed organizational meeting, like a number of communities. And someone stood up at that meeting on February 27th and asked what I thought was a very poignant question. How can we possibly move forward and build something together for our communities and our children when we're not together as a community? Although the vote to postpone was a decisive 50 to 22, that didn't resolve anything. It just caused more uh, conversation, discussion, even anger from some people, anxiety and division. And we now have a new meeting date set up for the organizational April 2nd. And I'm not sure how that's going to go down. I was the citizen who made the motion to delay. I know that if I hadn't done it, someone else would have. But I was concerned as I did it that it might endanger my campaign because I was at that point a candidate for Brattleboro Town School Board. And some thought I had made a big mistake in putting myself in that public role. Um, I'm only going to mention the results not to aggrandize myself, but just to reveal something about where our electorate is. I won overwhelmingly over the sitting chair of the Brattleboro School Board, who has been the chief spokesperson for the first forced merger in our community. We need relief from you as our representatives here in Montpelier. You have levers that we don't have. Public votes against the breakup of our supervisory union began early on when the town of Vernon needed to get out of our supervisory union because they wanted to preserve choice. Towns voted get, a town voted against them leaving, not because they didn't want Vernon to have choice. They voted against that to hold the union together as a bulwark against this four-town forced merger that would follow. It was not a vote against Vernon. It was not a vote against school choice. It was a vote for a five-town functioning supervisory union with a long history and a great track record of collect. We have probably collaborated on almost everything you can collaborate on. And we're willing to do more. And even while the merger articles were being put forward, an AGS committee of all five towns came together and produced that at the same time. We don't feel that was heard. I don't want to go into the particulars. A representative town meeting voted against some kind of forced imposition of the way we uh, govern our schools in 2014 in 2015, in 2017. In 2017, when the articles of merger for the preferred merger were put before the population in all four towns, those articles were defeated by more than two to one. In all four towns. And then, as I just told you the story about the most recent opportunity people had to weigh in, which was our school board election, in which we now have a new board with a new balance which is tilting away from the four-town merger. 
why, why this opposition to the merger? I mean, that's the obvious question. The alternative governance structure is still viewed in our area as the best way to preserve a functioning union that has gone on for years and years and could become even more collaborative. We have special education at the SU level, transportation, meals, uh, teacher in-service and training. We're doing all of this, OK? The other, and, and there's a feeling that that AGS did not get a fair hearing. And that is lingering. And that is holding the community apart. People don't want to move forward with the forced merger knowing that we didn't get our real listening to on what we can do with five towns that have historically worked together. We didn't get that because at the end, a kind of merger mania seemed to take hold, and we're just going to throw everybody in the merger pot. And that has led to um, this feeling that we need our day in court. And we are not going to come together and be able to build some new structure until we've had that day in court. We don't know what it, the outcome, as you've so well articulated, we don't know. But we need that day in court. If I could just um, please say a couple of words. So, please do. Um, you've had one day in court so far. So the preliminary injunction was, was one decision. Yeah. Then there'll be a decision on merits. Then there'll probably be an appeal. I understand that. So if you look into the judge's decision, one of the things he dealt with at some length was the, the feeling or the rumor or the belief that the state board never considered people's uh, alternate governance structures, that they didn't read them or they didn't spend any time talking about them. The judge uh, categorically rejected that argument. He said the record is replete with information that they had hundreds of hours of them going through discussions about local votes and alternative governance structures. So that doesn't change the belief mm -hmm. that your proposal was undervalued. I get that. But I just don't, I, I would recommend to everybody that you read that 25 page decision because there are many things that I feel in the communities in gray that are at law, I feel there are many things that are regarded as fact that the judge, mm -hmm. uh, it's not that he determines facts, but he does determine how the superior court interprets the record. And so that was one of the things that he tried to put to rest. I imagine in his final decision, he will say much the same. Thing. I will read that. I okay. appreciate that. There is a difference, though, sometimes the, there's the public perception, which, yeah. you've, which you've uh, you know, mentioned there, which is real. And I would say something similar happened with our study committee, which once it got on the preferred merger bandwagon, there was a often, oh, we already looked into that. Oh, we already looked into that. This went on for the whole process which was essentially sowing the seeds, undermining public support in the process. There was a point where our study committee had discretionary funds, and this was confirmed by the head of the study committee, that they had to decide how to spend some discretionary funds. They were choosing between an attorney or a public facilitator. They went with the attorney. Our process sowed the seeds of undermining support for this direction, and we're now sowing those. I'm, I'm close to the end here, and I hope we have time for a little conversation or questions. Um, and this ties in perfectly with where we are right now in the conversation. I understand that Act 46, I wasn't here, obviously, in, in Montpelier, but it was a very complicated bill to assemble, mm -hmm. to gain support for, to get through. Just, term, just in terms of the pieces of, of it. And I know that my senator said that one of the reasons that they were willing to support Act 46 was because of components like Section 9 and some flexibility in implementation. So I have a very strong belief that if components are put into legislation, 
which helped gain support for that legislation in the political process here in Montpelier. And then those components are not weighted very, with, with, uh, taken as seriously in the implementation phase, that that's a serious, serious undermining and confidence of this process. We read and studied Section 9. It seemed like the right way, and we never felt, those of us that were trying to move yeah. that direction, we never felt heard. And that's partly what the world we're living in right now. And I, I, I get that. OK. Let me just finish up. What uh, I'm just going to end by saying um, why I believe a delay, and my preference that I'm speaking here is, um, is for a clean delay. I have a lot of respect for anyone who's seeking compromise. I really mean that. Okay? And I'm, I'm intrigued by what's going on in this process. But I prepared my comments to speak in favor of, of a clean delay. Our, even our administrators, our financial officer, when asked at the uh, preliminaries of the organizational meeting, well, how much time would you really need to set all this up? He said, well, a year would be a normal amount of time to work with. Which is what we do in this bill at the House. Right now. Right. So, so didn't get a, our didn't superintendent has expressed anxiety over how do we get this thing on the ground by, by July 1st. So if that's one thing that a delay helps us with. Two, as has already been, I won't belabor it, the day in court. Time for the court. I think people will digest what the court says. I think that will put some finality on things one way or the other. Just, and, and I'm going to have yeah. to interrupt there yeah. again because I think people have the idea that when a law is passed, you have a right to a day in court, which you do, but then they also believe that you have a right to have that law not enforced until your case has run its course. Sometimes cases take five mm -hmm. years. Sometimes they take three years. Mm -hmm. But unless the judge grants a stay, then the law proceeds. I I so just so people aren't feeling um, like this is different from we have many, many laws that we passed last year, some of which are we're being sued for, and they are going forward. Um, and when those decisions are announced, then you know the disposition. I understand. So I do understand that, and I appreciate that. And the third thing, besides the administrative, the day in court, is just time for the community to digest which direction we're going in, and to try to be together before we're creating something new going forward. I'm going to end by just saying this. A delay bill for all forced mergers is an opportunity to bring integrity back into this process. It's in the best interest of reaching the goals of Act 46. Until we begin, until we as a community in Brattleboro can see the Act as a tool to help us fulfill our community aspirations, then we won't be together. On the other hand, if people begin to see the full promise of the legislation in relation to Vermont values and traditions, then I think we'll find a path forward. Please work out a delay bill with the Vermont House. Thank you for listening. And, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, your community, your county, is very important to me. You have two senators who I value very, very highly. When I looked at what the House did, and this committee looked very closely at it, one of the things that leapt out to me was your community was not addressed. We were disappointed. And the reasons why you weren't addressed did not seem fair to me. So I set it as one of my goals to make sure that you and communities like you had access to a delay. In order to do that, I'm also in this draft envisioning a couple of steps that are easily undone if the court rules in your favor, but to show that there is uh, good good faith in moving, taking a couple of steps forward in order to get more delay. So thank you. Any questions for the for the witness? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your work. Um, Miles Tudhill? Yes, sir. Did I pronounce that correctly? You did, sir. Nice. 
That's where I'm from, right there. Beautiful. Orwell. <laughs> I, it'd be great if every witness could point, point to their oh, Or not. Oh, wait. Or not. <laughs> so you heard me. I'm not sure if you were listening. At the I've been listening. Okay. So I said that the conditional mergers were deliberately left out of this draft because it seemed to me that if you were a town, <coughs> as I understand, Orwell has already worked out an arrangement. Is that correct? First of all, my name is Miles Tudhoe from Orwell. Yeah. Miss Hardy. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me my to be pleasure. here today. Orwell, yes, has followed the process. We have a unique situation in the town of Orwell voted three times not to merge. Townspeople voted overwhelmingly not to merge. Our school board did not support the town's position. Because back in the 18th century, Ethan Allen would have had something different to how we would handle that situation, but we are. You know, well, we may think it, but we don't move down that road. Yeah. The town is very frustrated. Uh, we were never included in the process because in the state hearing when they went before the board, they would only listen to the school board and the school board presented no alternative plan because they didn't believe, they didn't, didn't want Orwell to stay, to stay alone. But we as a community want that and so we've been very frustrated all along in the whole process. How many kids in your um, district? In Orwell. In Orwell, I believe there are around 135 students in the school right now. Mm -hmm. yeah, the community is growing, the school is growing. It's an outstanding school with some of the highest outcomes, with one of the lowest costs in the state. And we're being forced to merge with communities that the outcomes aren't as good and they have higher costs, which doesn't make any sense to most of us old Vermonters. And so we asked to be included, the citizens do, the school board isn't here arguing the case because they want to merge. Well, the citizens asked to be included in a delay so we could delay this forced merger. Now, let me under, try to understand better. So the, the board ruled November 28th that you were conditionally merged, and then there was a vote warned? That, that co-mingled deal, which I don't know where it came from, and we yeah. all said Orwell, so we don't even want to vote on that. You know, we don't. We, but the, whoever the powers to be, whoever's Lord Montpelier, has said that you have to do this. So it, it so happened. There was a there uh, was that vote, and and the and vote it, went out. The vote was positive that the other towns would allow us in. Okay. We don't want to be in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so want to be there. Okay. So at this point, you're not even a conditionally merged uh, town. You're a merged town. Yeah. Well, we're going to be forced to merge. That's my favorite. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So and we don't want that. Understood. Um, I think there are lots of places where people lost a vote, and I understand you saying you didn't like the commingle yeah. nature of the vote, but if you did it any other way, a community that didn't want to merge would never merge. That's the point. Well, that's my point also. <laughs> we don't want to merge. So Our outcomes are excellent, and our costs are low. And, and I, I'll just go back to, I've been here sitting at this table for the better part of 10 years now. Yeah. And one of the things that we have heard over and over and over again is this is a system built for 130,000 kids. We now have 77,000. And the system never, never managed to, to react to that. So we were asked to address that in major legislation in a way that would keep as much autonomy at as local a level as possible. And so what we we never went down the road of, we're going to close schools. Never thought about that. We never went down the road of saying, we're going to um, force schools themselves to be larger. So we went down the road of saying, our small schools are the root of a great system. All we're going to do is take the invisible boundary around that school, the district boundary, and expand it so it includes three schools. And with that slight adjustment in the invisible boundary, all of a sudden they can share students, they can share teachers, they can share everything. And I know that some schools have done that even without merger, but I was on a school board for four years. At the end of the day, my responsibility was my kids and my buildings. And I wasn't going to vote for something that would, 
that would maybe help the next community's kids, I was going to vote only for my kids. So by moving those boundaries, the invisible boundary, again, if you look at that map behind you, everybody in orange has satisfied F46. And when we talk to those communities, they are happy with the results by and large. Not that you can't find one district or one person or one board member, but by and large, they're happy. So I, I hear you, but I, in this bill, there's no way we could we could undo your vote and unmerge you at this point. I'm asking you to include it, to change it. That's what I'm saying. We can't do that. You can't do that. No, you're already you already satisfied the one condition to be merged. Somebody forced that upon us. It was your your the local community's vote. No, it wasn't. We voted three times not to merge. Well, Orwell. Orwell did. Yeah, that's yeah. what we're talking about. Orwell School Dress. Yes. I. Yeah. It just it doesn't make any sense. It would never had our yeah. our day in so to speak court to, to plead our case. I mean, at, at our school meeting, which was like a funeral. But at this last. So you elected last week. your school board members, right? Correct. And they went to the state and said they didn't want a Section Nine proposal. Correct. They, they, okay, but we can't. We can't. You elected them. They acted on your behalf and. And then you can vote them out. That's your. But revenue. it takes time. Yes. When you have a five-member board, and it, you know they're staggered members, it takes time to vote them out and change the board. And this is all happening so fast, you don't have time to change the board. I'll tell you another version of this that we get all the time. So just now we had the town meeting votes. They passed overwhelmingly, 95 percent or 97 percent of state school budgets passed. But every year we will get people who come in and say. It's not fair. There's a lot of people in my town who didn't want the school budget to pass, but it did. So what they will come in and they'll gin up their representatives to bring out something and send it to us that will, in effect, lower their taxes, even though their community voted to raise taxes. So I think to the extent we, we can here, we should be dealing with people who need the delay. And, and that's all this bill will deal with. But I can't see any circumstance where we could undo a, a, a vote that you had and lost. Well, the legislature can do what they want. They created Act 46. It's true. They could create Act 47 that says stop force mergers. They could do that. Mr. Toto, thank you so much for coming and for your time. And I hear your frustration loud and clear. And I heard your frustration at your town meeting last week that I attended. And um, <clears throat> I'm sorry that we can't address what you and, and uh, at least half the citizens in Orwell have, have said they have wanted in three previous votes. I know that each vote has been quite close in the town of Orwell, and it's, it's been a very divisive issue. Um, we've tried our best to come up with a compromise that meets the needs of as many districts as we can, but because Orwell had that vote, or because the Slate Valley towns, um, districts had that vote, it's something that we can't undo at this point. And so I'm, I'm really sorry, and I'm, I appreciate that you came, and I, I want you to know that I did my best to make sure your voice was heard. I appreciate that. Uh, just a couple more comments, and I'll leave you to your business. You stated earlier, recommending to some towns to pass parallel budgets in case this lawsuit uh, gets... Uh, That's one way to do it as well. We tried to do that at our school meeting. But someone from the Department of Education or the Secretary of the State sent a message minutes before the school meeting to rule out of order anybody that tried to put a parallel budget on the table to be in place in case you know, the, the whole thing goes flop. Yeah, I'm not sure why. And it could have been because it wasn't worn properly or any no. number of reasons why they might have waited. The, the beauty of town meetings yeah. is you can do things from the floor. It's not like Burlington and all these big cities. That's that's one of the great things about small towns is you can decide things right there on the floor. Yeah, I, I just mean I can't speak for AOE or why they might have said that. I just want to say one more thing. I completely agree that the Orwell School is a great school, and I am 
fairly confident that after you are over this hump, it will continue to be a great school. You have an amazing principal and a really amazing program there. And you should feel really proud of that. So. But we all are. That's why we want to maintain the autonomy and authority over it. Because the, the other where you're going it doesn't work anywhere near as good as we. If they all want to join Orwell, that'd be fine. <laughs> you know, but it's, Maybe that's why they voted to take you, because they want to be more like you. Thank you. But the effect on your communities, I don't think anybody in the legislature really realized the effect on the community. Like I said, that school meeting was like a funeral. Well, and the meetings, that they're all going to be down at Fair Haven, yeah. and nobody's going to go. If you look around this room, I've, I've done this a hundred times on this bill. So I have heard so many people tell me they don't feel hurt. So I, I just want to say to you, I've, I have listened as much as a human oh, can possibly listen. I'll leave them. Every year we've had the room full many times. So in, in, in terms of the communities that are at issue, this is maybe my fifth time hearing from members of your community about your, your individual problems. So well, let me ask Thank you one more question. Yeah. What do we tell our children? When they're aware of the democratic process and civics, they learn all about this yeah. stuff. And they ask you, the town voted three times not to merge. Why is someone dictating and forcing us to do it when democracy isn't acting? And, and that's what they're seeing. And that's what and that's the way the public feels. Well, I would just and that's a problem. I'd say one thing, which is what the town voted on were proposals designed by your study committee to merge. As far as I'm concerned, they never had the yes or no on whether to merge. That was always in Act 46 in the end game in the hands of the Secretary and the State Council. But I, it's I, not democratic. You know, it, if, if each one of you have been through an election yeah. and you all got elected, and what if somebody, Montpelier, said, Sir, you're not going to be in the, on the, in the State Senate. We're going to put somebody else in there. We're going to ignore the vote, and that's what's happening. I understand that's your opinion. Yep. Th thank you, sir, for coming in. So, uh, Scott Thompson. I believe we... Excuse me. How are you, Mr. Thompson? Very well, thank you. Now, for instance, this is not the first time you and I have spoken. No, I'm a repeat offender. <laughs> um, Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. While I'm handing these around, um, <clears throat> thanks. I'm Scott Thompson. I represent Callis on the U32 board. And um, on this occasion, uh, I'm basically speaking for myself because it's hard to know who I'm speaking for anymore. Um, I was honored, as you mentioned, to be able to address your committee in its 2017 vintage. Um, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do so again today. <clears throat> grateful and a little bit perplexed at the same time. You know, as looking around the room and way down the corridor, um, everyone here speaks English. We all basically look as though we're cut from similar cloth. And yet, listening to the discussion, it's as though we inhabit two very different planets. Um, on one planet, everything is for the best in the best of all possible governance systems. And perhaps strong arm tactics work to force deviance into submission. On the other planet, getting yourself accused of violating children or being a Nazi just means it's another day of forced merger work where citizens respond to strong arm tactics in a manner diametrically opposed to what the apparent intention is. And you know, where town clerks and election volunteers are groaning under the burden of frantic, uncoordinated mornings and what's shaping up to be the spring of way too many votes. So with this kind of 
thing going on. Um, I, I worry that communication of any kind might be very nearly impossible. But I figure the difficulty of it is the most urgent and important reason to try to bridge it as much as possible. At least maybe bring those planets within hailing distance of each other, if nothing else. So um, I guess with that, um, I'm going to approach this in my classic way, backwards, and um, look first at the second half of, of this handout. Um, I know that there's been discussion of the denial of the preliminary injunction. I should just point out that perhaps some of the understanding should be nuanced to take account of, for example, uh, the judge having written that the court is troubled by the debt issue, and that um, because it hasn't yet been briefed by the parties, um, he had nothing further to say about it. Um, so at this point, although troubled, he has to consider that the effects as speculative. So I'm just inviting you for a moment to um, come speculate with me in the etymological sense of the term, to observe, contemplate. And um, the numbers here are taken from the audit reports. And there's only one assumption that I ask that needs to be accepted, which is that as the towns grow or shrink in population or wealth, they do so in roughly the same proportion as they are today. So with that, we come to a, um, basically, the total line shows a divergence of uh, an inequity between Calais and Worcester, the two poorer towns, East Montpelier, the second wealthiest town, of um, close to $6 million over a period of 19 years. Um, because it's... Where's the six? How, I'm missing the six print. Um, right. If Callis and Worcester together are roughly the same size as East Montpelier. Yeah. So Callis and Worcester together are going up by 3.5, say. Um, they're, they're disadvantaged. The extra that they're paying, 2.1 million plus 1.4 million. I don't know. Where, I'm sorry, I don't know where you are. Looking at the total? Way to the right. Yes, ah, way okay. to the right. My apologies. <laughs> yes, I, I, I promise not to get too far down in this. But the important point is that it's not just that Worcester and Callis are paying more. The counterpart to that is that East Montpelier is paying less. So that inequity includes both the more that Callis and Worcester are paying and the less. So that essentially, that, um, that is the difference between what merger does versus non-merge. Now, I know um, this may be part of the reason why the parties have not briefed the judge, because um, I'm the world's worst explainer of things. But um, the, what I did try to do is translate it into Chittenden um, and show that total column as if each of the towns were Burlington, were the same size as Burlington, and what those amounts would look like if that were the case, just so that you have a sense of, of magnitude of this. Um, the essential point is that it would be as if asking Burlington to undertake or to impose on Burlington without a vote, without any money, without any improvements, the obligation to pay off over a period of 20 years a $45 million bond. And I know Burlington had a $70 million bond recently that was big news all over. It was approved overwhelmingly but they got money for it. So I'm not sure. They got money for it. The, the school, um, the Burlington High School, uh, basically they bonded, 
so as to improve their facilities. But what do you mean they got, I mean, I'm from Burlington, what do you mean we got money? Yeah, well, they, they got to spend the money they borrowed. Yeah. Here, they're just paying off money they didn't have to spend. Oh, oh, oh. I yeah. see. Yeah. I see. The bond yeah. 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 see what I mean? I'm demonstrating my yeah. point. Yeah, okay. Apologies. <laughs> what this is all leading to is that um, uh, this debt business is not some, is not some phony, you know, made up thing. I know there's um, there's a notion going around that it can be solved in the Articles of Agreement. Um, this is a common misconception. If it could have been solved in the Articles of Agreement, you can bet Donna Russo Savage would have come up with the language, for one thing. Um, and if anybody tells you that it can be solved in the Articles of Agreement, please say to them, that your friends in Washington Central would be overjoyed to see the actual language. And if they can provide that, mm -hmm. we'll embrace them on both cheeks and salute their genius in public. But <clears throat> for now, I have a feeling that we may be in a similar situation to two years ago, where, if you recall, the legislature, I think, Correct me if I'm wrong, please. They have had the idea that Act 49 would be kind of the final, uh, the final word, the final legislative word on school district consolidation. And um, of course, here we are now. Um, I think it's not inconceivable that even though the H39, as it is now um, with your committee, may be intended to kind of <clears throat> sew things up, you know, basically, you know, pending action by the courts, of course. But um, it wouldn't surprise me if school district consolidation were on the agenda again next year in some form, whether it's debt, whether it's any number of other of these little bony nuggets of contention. And if I can just jump in there with a couple of things. So I, I feel redundant, but again, if you look at the map behind you, this has been a process. Everybody who's uh, marked in gold has satisfied Act 46 in one way or another. Some of those came from Act 49 from the changes we made. Um, when we are back here next year, there will be more of those in gold. I don't think everybody will be um, will be moved when we are here next year because this committee is trying to get you a year delay. Yes. So um, I don't want anybody to lose sight of the fact that the only place in the building that has been willing to grant a year delay is this room. So um, I understand people are not necessarily perfectly happy with the condition that comes with those delays, but elsewhere in the building, that possibility doesn't even exist. So. There's that. So when we come back next year, my goal is to make sure we're not in Groundhog Day at the exact same place. So that's why the bill says, at the very least, communities have to form that first uh, initial board, and then they can make the decision to delay. Then, let's say, June 1st comes, and the judge rules, and let's say his ruling is very similar to his preliminary injunction ruling, and he says, Act 46 is on firm footing, and the merger should go forward. At that point, I would hope that many of the districts that have been waiting for that moment would go forward. Mm -hmm. Some of them might say, hell no, we're going to wait for the Supreme Court. But this body next year uh, is not going to act to delay the merger process any further. Mm -hmm. So it's presented in this bill as a final delay, whereas in Act 49, it was presented as a delay to get to the end. So I'm, I hear what you're saying, and, and in a worst case scenario, you're right, but I hope not. Well, I understand. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, the bill that you have with your committee right now, um, I am not speaking directly to it, because um, on my plan, it doesn't contextualize. So I'm kind of speaking around it, which takes me back up to the top of, of this um, to, I suppose, um, that uh, 
handy four-letter mnemonic for um, for a process. And I think does it end in stupid? It does not. Okay. It's an evaluation. Yes. I thought it was keep it simple. No, no, no. That's another four-letter mnemonic. Okay. Yeah. There's no shortage. But um, <laughs> this, I think, will have no bearing whatsoever on what we're doing. Because what I'm saying here, I doubt if it contextualizes in, on your planet. <laughs> um, so essentially, what I would like to do is offer this um, as a gift from my planet to yours. Um, I come in peace. <laughs> from the planet. And you always have. <laughs> I just want to say that. This guy's been brilliant. He is. Thanks. Um, but from the, from the planet, forced merger reality on the ground. Yeah. Uh, and what I try to do is convey a thumbnail design for a way for the state to govern in this matter with, with wisdom, with caring, and with humility in the face of a human reality that just so far outstrips our individual powers of comprehension. So um, there's a double gift in it, too. If you have this for next year's <laughs> round, then you won't have to have him back. <laughs> we won't have to, you won't have to copy them anyway. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Well, thank you, sir. Any any questions? Scott, uh, thanks for your testimony, and, and <clears throat> sorry to it. Uh, but do you have, I know you, since the bill that we're looking at is from this other planet, as you say, so it's hard for you to, like, really weigh in on it, but I wonder if you've given thought to it as compared to the House version, which for your district, other districts didn't get a delay, but your district did get a delay in the House version, so I don't know if you at least have an opinion on it, those two. Um, I, uh, may I, um, <laughs> you don't have to answer. Yeah, uh, um, anything I say will make someone angry, and unnecessarily. I mean, I'm not, I'll make somebody angry if it, if it has a purpose. Welcome to our planet. <laughs> I don't doubt it, yes. Um, but, my, it's like it's a choice, a too bad choice. Yeah, um, my own my own attitude at this point is fatalistic, and it's with the people. I mean, with the people of our communities, they're going to do things that that you know may not be what I would do. They're um, they're very much engaged. They're very much you know um, reacting to everything that's happening now. Uh, well, I was just going to make a comment about the, the whole debt question. Um, one of the one of the school districts in our Senate district um, had, you know, they the four towns got together and one town had quite a lot of debt, and the other three said, "Well, it's them now, but it'll be us later." Yeah. So, you know, and I personally am paying property taxes for another town's uh, debt that they incurred, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm sure that at some point the school, you know, and the town where I live will will need. You know, to incur debt too. Yeah, and, and that that is um, that was a major point in the statewide proposal that you know the school that has no bond today will need a new roof tomorrow and all of that. Um, it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem because there are schools that need new roofs that don't need the bond. Actually, Worcester and Cowles are good examples of having replaced their roofs without bonding in stages. Um, and the, the other thing that I might just say to that is that um, in my desultory adventures um, in trying to figure out what's going on with this, I haven't yet run across any state that forces mergers that in turn force the taking on of other towns' bonded indebtedness. Every one that I've come across in Kansas, Montana, Michigan, Utah, um, and it goes on from there, they all have provisions for isolating that debt and having it paid off 
by the so-called disorganized district. Um, so, you know, I think it's just kind of a technical yeah. issue. Well, the last thing I want to say is two years ago when we did Act 49, I heard, I heard from you, I heard from Janet Ansel, I heard from your representatives, and so we deliberately included in Act 49 language that forced the State Board to consider differential levels of debt when they made their decisions. So I, hear, I see you shaking your head. Is that not true? Well, well it, they, it, they it, we talked about it. My point was rather that we added it to the law and they did discuss it. It's in the record. So my, my point being that, again, if, if you don't feel heard, sometimes, I don't know why I would share this, but sometimes my wife will say to, to me, you don't say I love you as much as you used to. And I say, I say I love you every morning, which I do. But she somehow stopped hearing me. So I, I just want to make sure that you bring to consciousness that we spoke before and I put in legislation to help deal with your problem. The state board made a decision that all things being equal, the debt issue was not enough to prevent the merger. I, we didn't make that decision, but we were there for you two years ago, and we're, we're here this year to offer the delay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. OK. So Devin Batchelder? Is Devin here? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. districts, um, you know, I agree with those arguments that they've presented, but rather than reiterate some of that, um, I do want to talk about another perspective. Whether you're from a district that has merged, or a district that's being forced to merge, or a district that's been passed over, um, it's vital that we remember that we all want the same thing. We want to look back at Act 46 and we're all done. We want to look back at the process and declare that it has been a success. <clears> the <throat> success in improving student outcomes, increasing access to educational opportunities, and improving the efficiency of our schools. In that effort, we're all on the same team. <clears throat> in that spirit, I want to talk about the opportunity that a delay presents to this committee in terms of improving the final outcomes of the Act 46 implementation process. And what you should know about me is I tend to reduce everything down to mathematical models, which my wife hates. Um, <laughs> so you and Corey get along. <laughs> yeah. We have a similar background in that. Yes, that's true. Um, so I believe, excuse me, that the process as written in legislation actually provided an opportunity for an exceptional uh, result, but that the manner uh, in which a particular part of the process was implemented, implemented will lead to suboptimal results. Um, so just to get a little technical here, we'll hit the math quickly and then, and then move on to the main points. I think where this stems from is how we understand the conclusions that are reached in what's referred to um, in Section 1, G, and H of Act 46 as national literature. The literature on the benefits of larger district sizes, both in terms of academic outcomes and financial efficiencies, is fairly easy to find. Uh, many studies demonstrate the fact that larger districts tend to have higher academic performance and lower cost per equalized people. However, the phrase tend to is very important in that. <clears throat> when it's omitted, and we say that larger districts have higher academic performance and lower cost per equalized people, we're left at believing creating a larger district will result in higher academic achievement and lower cost per equalized people. Looking at cost per equalized pupil for a moment, 
If we understand the literature to mean that a larger district will result in a lower cost group of white people, then we could plot schools on a chart that looks like the one that's in that handout. Where the increase in the number of equalized pupils results in a lower cost for equalized people in, in virtually every case. This would suggest that by merging any districts, we could achieve a lower cost. This is the thinking that leads us to implement the one-size-fits-all approach. When viewed this way, it's easy to forget that we're trying to accomplish the five goals laid out in Act 46. And instead, we say large size equals low cost. And we say large size equals higher achievement. When you do this, <coughs> um, increased district size becomes the only goal. However, what the data actually looks like is in that second graph. It's certainly not right along that trend line. This is pulled from the Agency of Education website. The downward trend still exists. So it's still correct to say that larger districts tend to have a lower cost per pupil, but the relationship's not as definitive as the prior statement. And the same relationship exists when it comes to academic achievement. There's a graph in here. Um, from a study published by Illinois State University showing student achievement score against the rank order of the, the district size. That positive trend exists, but not all points fall along that trend line. Cost data is what I'm going to talk about for the rest because it's easier to, to, to pull and work with. Um, but the trend line is important because it represents our best guess of what the results of any merger would be. For instance, if three smaller districts were to be merged into a district of 1,000 equalized pupils, we would expect the cost per equalized pupil in that new district to be slightly higher than $13,500 based on that AOE data. You can see that green, that green line charting out where that new district would fall. In most cases, the move along this line to the right represents an improvement, which is why the national literature concludes that there are advantages to larger districts. It's also why many communities throughout Vermont have elected to form merged districts, either in the past or as part of this process which we can see on the map up here. We would expect that more of them would want to do that because they've judged that those, in those situations, improvements would be expected. If we strictly adhere to this model and merge districts wherever possible, what we expect is for the new districts to fall along that trend line, <clears throat> but further to the right and the lower end. And this is the movement to the right, which <coughs> represents the savings that we expect to realize. However, we can do better. And the amendments to Act 46 that are in Act 49 told us how. This is where the real power and wisdom of the Section 9 process can be found. In general, we expect merged districts to move to the trend line. In most cases, this results in a lower cost. But what if the proposed mergers between districts that already have a cost that's below the expected cost of the resulting merged district. Likewise, what if the academic achievement is currently better than what we would expect post-merger? To provide a real-world example, uh, using that cost data again in my home district in Franklin, um, I've highlighted the districts of Franklin, Highgate, Sheldon, and Swanton on that next graph, the, on the, the red diamond. Yeah, the red diamonds of those four districts. The weighted average cost per pupil among those four districts as it stands uh, as when this data was published was $12,568. But we would expect a cost per equalized pupil to be $13,685 given the cost, or given the size of the resulting three-town merged district as proposed or as being enforced. In this case, the move towards the trend line produces unfavorable results. As I stated before, the literature agrees that an association exists because more often than not, this move toward the trend line will be favorable. It's understandable that the Agency of Education and the State Board of Education would strictly adhere to the model because we would expect it to produ produce favorable results in aggregate. By moving everyone toward the average, we would expect to achieve some savings or higher educational outcomes, as that's equivalent here. But this level of savings actually represents sort of the minimum level of success that could be achieved because it implements the good along with the bad. It moves everyone towards that expected value, toward that average. 
I would describe this approach as an average implementation, resulting in an average overall governance structure and an average educational delivery system. Act 46 provides a means by which we can move districts toward that trend line when that move is favorable. And Section 9 provides a way to avoid moving districts toward that trend line when that move is unfavorable. Can I just, can I just um, ask, are you suggesting then that we re replay the, the Section 9 process with the legislature vetting them? Uh, that would be one potential solution. I would, I would, I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, this body, I'm asking that this body would to would be, would exercise this role in providing overs oversight of this process and realize that there's a better way to do this. There's a better outcome to be had, and that may re require either the state board looking at these again with more clear instructions from this group, or this group itself, this body itself, reviewing those those section nine proposals. <coughs> Um, so making this distinction and acting accordingly was what would transform an average implementation into an exceptional one. This is the difference between merging wherever possible and merging wherever necessary. Realizing this opportunity <clears throat> could be what differentiates Vermont post-merger system from other places like Maine and West Virginia, where the one-size-fits-all model is implemented and where merges where mergers occurred wherever possible and where the overall success is highly questionable. We all want Act 46 to succeed. We all want a sustainable educational delivery system. We all want more efficient schools and better outcomes for our kids. The Section 9 process and the alternative governance structures were meant to go hand in glove with the district mergers to produce the best possible statewide system. Section 9 allows the districts to feel that they are exceptions to the model in terms of cost and or educational opportunity to identify themselves and present their case that merging would not be the best model in that district at this point in our history. When this part of the process is overlooked, as it has been in the opinion of multiple districts here today, we become average. Why would we pursue average policy? Why would we advocate? for an average result. Why be average when the tools, information, and the legal framework have been provided to us so that we can be better than that? If even one district is properly identified and allowed to continue to operate with better than expected outcomes and with better than expected costs, then we as a whole are better than average. The more districts that we properly identify and allow to continue to achieve the exceptional results the greater this difference between ourselves and average will become. The districts that continue to push back against forced mergers could be viewed by some as stubborn and uncooperative. However, what these districts are in fact doing is sending out a warning signal to the legislature, attempting to call your attention to the fact that there is a better way of implementing this law. They're calling your attention to the fact that we're leaving opportunities on the table by moving all districts toward the average. <clears throat> the legislature and the agency of education, the state board of education would be, would be wise to pause and listen, not to summarily dismiss these concerns or these voices. They'd be wise not to dismiss your fellow Vermonters, but rather to see this feedback for the opportunity that it is because likely it's the final decision regarding these districts that will determine whether we end up with an average or an exceptional public education system in the state. As a lifelong Vermonter and as a taxpayer, as a school board member in Franklin, and as a father of three young children, I find it unacceptable that we would look at the tools in front of us, <clears throat> see that we have an opportunity to build an exceptional educational system, and yet we would settle for being average. I urge this committee to issue a delay, a no strings attached delay for all districts that are being forced to merge to give the State Board of Education another opportunity to take a look at the Section 9 proposals with clear guidance or for the legislature itself to take on that role. <clears throat> we need to have an open and honest dialogue between the reviewers and the submitting districts to find these opportunities that I described. 
We've had two districts so far, and I'll be the third to say that we have not felt heard during those Section 9 uh, proposals. We did not feel that we had that back and forth on our um, alternative governance structure proposals. Uh, I have read that legal decision, and I understand that what the State Board did meant the legal bar. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's good policy. And this, this body here, I think, has a vested interest and I hope would hold them that to a higher bar. Because what we're after is the best possible end result, not simply meeting a legal bar. Only in this way can we ensure that we best meet the goals of Act 46 for each school, each region in the state of Vermont. We can do better, we should do better, we must do better. We cannot settle for being average. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I I very much appreciate that was a uh, very, um, I think, moving statement of something that we all agree with, which is that we want to have exceptional education and um, educate our kids as well as we possibly can. What I would say is I've, I've spoken with both the old Secretary of Ed, the new Secretary of Ed, and the State Board at great length many, many times about how they were conducting the process because I had my eye on it all the way through. And I know that State Board and the Secretary, let's take Secretary Holcomb because she had the most to do with that. Um, again, they spent hundreds of hours going through the files, going through the proposals, and doing what they believe to be um, not moving to create average schools, but moving to create exceptional schools. Now, I can see that you don't you don't agree with that, but again, I would, I would, if if you're tempted to dismiss the process that the state AOE and um, the state board went through, it was laborious, and they went up and down the state three or four times holding hearings, as well as individual meetings with boards. So, um, I I hope you won't go to your grave thinking that they wanted average outcomes for our kids. I understand that. Yep. They did not, and that they were doing what they thought was best. Yep. Unfortunately, I do disagree that I believe the results have put us in that position. Fair enough. Um, and it's it's unfortunate that, that when we did reach out to the State Board to have that open dialogue about our particular uh, alternative permanent <coughs> structure, mm -hmm. structure proposal, we did not re receive a response from them, mm -hmm. um, which, which certainly did not help us to believe that there was. Did you meet with Secretary Holcomb or, or Donna Russo Savage? We did have an initial meeting prior to uh, Bob Berger had that meeting. He'll speak next. So yep. I'll let him speak to that. Okay. Um, Senator Hardy. Can I pass? I have a question sure. for you and then a question for you. Sure. Um, you're the gray. I'm just trying to make sure because you don't put yourself out. Sorry. You, are you the gray up in the that north northwest corner? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, and okay, I think I. A center parent has talked about your situation, so I understand it. I'm trying to remember the map, the white on the map, those districts in white were mine. Those, those are Georgia, Fairfax, and Black No, I mean, all across right. the Same map. What, what the is white, the white? The white one are left alone. Yeah, white means they were alone. left alone. So, one, one way to look at this visually, just since you are highly visual here, if you look at that map, orange is already satisfied. Gray is under order to merge, and white was examined, analyzed, and left as they were. So, so if you look, I'm sorry. Yeah, if you look at the ratio mm -hmm. of gray to white, it's pretty deep. And if you look at the number, about half the ones considered by the Secretary and the State Board were not asked to merge. The other half were. So, again, when Judge Mello looked at this, he said there wasn't. He, he did not find it persuasive, the argument that the State Board had forced everybody to merge, because if you look at the numbers, uh, they did. It's so the, what, so, I would just want yes. to follow up on this. So the white districts, in are not effect, got an, a, a Section 9. What, well, yeah. well, I'm not trying to understand. Some of them might have, <laughs> might have put forward a Section 9 proposal that, was, um, that the State Board ruled was uh, good enough that they didn't have to merge, and then other people weren't merged no. because... I'm sorry? Uh, the state board Excuse me, ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Ma'am, ma'am, 
you're going to have to leave if you won't observe the chair. So what I'm saying is the, the ones in white were left as they were, and the state board sometimes considered um, the Section 9 proposal. They did not, um, some people objected to the fact that they did not positively accept Section 9 proposals. So if they liked the Section 9 proposal, they left the district as it was. But there were also cases where people's operating systems were different. And given that the operating systems were different, they were not allowed to merge them. So that's some of the white Got it. as okay. well. Just the, that's the majority of the white. 36 of those were not possible to merge yeah. uh, due to yeah. the structural differences. Yep. I love your mathematical dots. Thank you very much. Can I speak? I'm sorry, Sheldon wasn't here, isn't here. I know you received a written testimony, but just since they're a member of Franklin Northwest, I, I do want to point out um, potentially a, a fatal flaw in the language of H39 as drafted now that requires the uh, unified boards to, to vote on um, whether there's a delay or not. I can see a very real possibility that the Montgomery, Sheldon, Bakersfield, Berkshire group would vote to delay and that the Franklin Northwestern Supervisory Union Group, Swanton Highgate Franklin, may not. And so if we move forward front Swanton Highgate Franklin, then Sheldon's out. But if that other group were to to delay, then they're not accepting Sheldon. I, I, I'm having a hard time to follow. So Sheldon, when Sheldon was moved, they were not only moved, they moved supervisory unions. So they're depending, if, his point is, is if you have delay and not a delay, depending on which, if their supervisory union chooses not to delay and merge, come here, they'll be left without a supervisory union to provide that. So we're, we're not, so. the state board has the power to move supervisory unions, so that's not covered by what we're doing. No, that's, what I'm suggesting is that if there were to be a new unified district of Swanton, Highgate, Franklin, then we're, we're essentially <coughs> moving Sheldon out of our district, our, not part of our district, and we're off doing our own thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is, is Sheldon Sheldon's required to merge? Franklin Northwest Supervisory Union, Swanton, Highgate, Franklin, Sheldon. But let's, the, merger, the, the supervisory union thing is confusing me, so okay. let's, let's just say who's under order to merge? Swanton, Highgate, Franklin. Okay, and so... And then Sheldon's required to merge with Montgomery, Berkshire... In a supervisory union? No, in, in a new in school a district. New district. Okay, so that's a different right. situation. And so... Where does Sheldon go if we part, only part of that process moves forward? Okay, so let me understand. So they're with the, 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 the other required merger is Sheldon and who? Montgomery, uh, Montgomery Berkshire, Bakersfield, which is already in. So those four. Okay, so what we are saying is uh, Swan, Highgate, and Franklin would form their initial board and then they could take it away if they wanted to. And the others, Sheldon, Montgomery, Ber uh, Bircher, yep. and um, Bakersfield, yeah. they could do the same thing. So I'm not There's sold. the possibility that one of those two would not take the delay. Yes. So it, so it, it essentially orphans Sheldon if. I don't understand how it orphans Sheldon, I'm sorry. Well, the, 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 the order is to move Sheldon to the, the new four. Yes. They're currently in the Franklin North so there, Advisory. So there would be a warned vote for those four towns, including Sheldon. Mm -hmm. And so I, I... So they delay. Imagine they delay. Yes. So now they're not accepting Sheldon into the, the Franklin is, North East Supervisory Union or the Merger sure. District. Okay, the Supervisory Union is a different question. Yeah. It's... We're not... We're not we're not, the state board doesn't need to have permission to change your supervisory unions. So in that situation, you, I guess you, you would say they would move Sheldon to the new supervisory union without merging them into a new district? Is that the I, we're, we're not dealing with what the state board has said or done with supervisory unions. I'm saying that those two situations that you laid out, one with four towns, one with three, mm -hmm. they would each elect a, an initial board and then they could decide to move forward or not. So if Sheldon elects the initial board as part of that four-town merger, yes. 
they no longer have a voice in the Swanton Franklin Highgate plan, which includes removing Sheldon from the Franklin Northwest Supervisory Union. No, they they have their supervisory union is not affected by this. So even if they if I, I'm taking your word that they are in a supervisory union with the other three. And if they are, the state board has the power to alter the supervisory union boundary to reflect the new districts, which I assume is what they are doing. Mm -hmm. So I can't see a situation where Sheldon is orphaned because they will only let them out of their SU if they're going to put them in another one because the SU is where you deliver special ed and transportation. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I'm happy to talk with you later, but I can't, so far I can't see why there's a uh, an orphan problem. Okay. Yeah, uh, maybe we should. I mean, maybe yeah, we're I'm, I'm happy to once we're done the testimony if you want to hang around. All right, I'm not sure I may be hanging around. Okay, uh, or maybe you can like communicate it to Corey and we'll talk. Okay. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bob Berger. Welcome, Mr. Berger. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, I feel a little disadvantaged uh, having been in the hall. I haven't been able to hear all of the back and forth. So if I repeat something or tread on ground that has already been covered, pardon that and, and bear with me. Um, but from what I have heard, and I, I do have, I don't know if I can't have, that has what I intended to say. It also has a link to our alternative governance structure proposal, and I included our executive summary as well. Okay. But from what I'm hearing, and what I've observed so far today, every person that sat at this end of the table has had concerns with the way the alternative governance structure proposal uh, situation was handled, the way that was implemented. I understand you've had conversations with the State Board of Education and the Agency of Education, and they assure you that everything was handled just uh, fine. I'm not sure how many people have to sit at this end of the table and tell you that it was not handled just fine. Uh, we were the boots on the ground. We were the ones that spent hundreds of hours in committee coming up with those alternative government structure proposals, only to be called cranky and resistant uh, by the State Board of Education. You know, believe that uh, you can go to the October 17th meeting at uh, 2:46:08 is a timestamp where John Carroll called us that. Um, we've been treated as people that sat on the sideline and hoped that this would go away, that we could weather the storm, and that this would all just blow by. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. We worked hard uh, to be fully compliant with the law, the way that we understood the law. Section 9 was a part of Act 46. And Section 9 allowed for districts that didn't fit the mold to be able to provide an alternative government structure proposal that did meet their needs and provide a way to meet the goals of Act 46. Um, we did the pre-706 study, and we found out for after having public forums with our committees and with our communities, that was not an option for our, our voters. They let it be known plain and simple that they had no interest in working. And it's for a variety of very good reasons, um, not the least of which is community history, culture, and past um, issues that communities have had with each other, um, even in recent times. On top of that, when you look at the disparity of the size and the cost per pupil of our schools, you end up with the smallest school, which according to your model shouldn't happen, but our smallest school is Franklin. It's also the most efficiently run school as far as cost per pupil, and it's also, also the highest achieving school. So it's an anomaly amongst all of your models. Um, and, and it stands to prove that one size does not fit all. When we looked at the numbers as a committee across all of our communities, we found that the numbers show that tax rates would go up uh, significantly in Franklin because of that disparity in the cost per pupil cost of educating our kids. If I remember goal five of Act 46 is to deliver education at a cost that the taxpayers and voters value. Uh, and I don't know anyone that values increased taxes. We brought that to the agency of ed when we met with Secretary Holcomb 
and discuss that concern. And even though we showed the numbers in her analysis, which it wasn't actually her analysis, it was the acting secretary's analysis when it came out in the, the initial plan, um, that was dismissed. Our numbers were, the you know, um, authenticity of our numbers was brought into question. It was a question of whether the computation took into account, you know, uh, potential savings that could be realized by creative use of our resources and the, the more flexibility of a larger district. Well, I'm here to say that that completely discounts all the work that they had done to that point with creative uh, use of their, their resources, sharing positions across districts, sharing contracts, sharing bulk purchasing, all of that had already been done. There's a reason that our school spends less than 92% of the other schools in the state of Vermont because we've been efficient, we've been responsible. There were no, no additional savings that we could find. So our computation were real tax numbers based on historical data, and the only thing different was a merged budget and a merged model. And it bore out that the tax rates would go up. When we presented that concern, again, it was, it was dismissed. I responded to that in writing to the State Board of Education uh, and then gave oral testimony to them in July of last year in Newark to the same effect. Again, it was dismissed. Um, and, and we want to talk about votes that we had. Um, you want to talk about communities and people who are, I'll admit we ended up that cranky because we did get there. We, we were cranky because we felt like nobody was listening to us through this entire process. We, we were doing our best in good faith to come up with a way to meet the goals of the law. And uh, we ran up against a brick wall at every step of the process. When we had votes in our community that were unanimous, not in just one community, but three of the communities affected, unanimous. Let that sink in for a moment. You guys are in politics. You know what a unanimous vote means and how rare that is. Not in just one community, three communities. People supported, they did not want merger. They realized that it was not the best option for our children, and they supported our alternative government structure proposal. So, sir, I, I, I hear you, I, my heart goes out to you, I'm, I'm listening, but we have a room full of witnesses. So far you haven't spoken to the bill that we have in front of us. I, so I, the thing that you might have missed since you had to be on the hall was, I said if you spend your time talking about the, the passage of Act 46 or about how the state board operated, then unfortunately you'll get to the end and you won't have said anything about the legislation at work. I understand. And, yeah. and, but everyone that sat here has not been heard and they feel like they and, need to be heard. And so, if you want to spend your time that way, you can. I, I understand and I appreciate that flexibility. Yeah. But um, I, I think the committee needs to know that the process was not carried out in the way that it seems to have been represented to you. Um, I understand you have your map up here, you have your color-coded diagrams. I understand also that half of those white, or over half of those white blocks were because you couldn't merge them because it was physically impossible to do so. Um, I know that none of those were, were Act 40 or Section 9 proposals. So let me get to the time. Let me get to why we need a delay because that's important. Uh, trying to give you some background on why the voters in our districts are upset. You have a lot of angry people, a lot of frustrated people. They're cranky. So Mr. Carroll was not far off the mark when he called us cranky, with good reason. Um, we're looking now at having to bring a, a condensed timeline um, to bring a vote on a, condensed, or a merged budget by June 4th to <coughs> these voters. These voters have continuously been ignored. They feel frustrated. They have gone to the meetings, they've written letters. Uh, we tried to have an open dialogue with the State Board of Education that was ignored. When you bring them a budget vote, people who are frustrated tend to take out their, their feelings at the ballot box. And my real concern is that if we bring them a merged budget on June 4th, they're going to vote their displeasure at the whole process, regardless of how responsible the budget is. This bill doesn't ask you to do that. This bill makes it so you don't have to bring a merged budget by July of this year. And, and I understand that portion, portion of the bill. Um, 
but I also understand the conditions behind that to get to that point. You have to merge, you have to elect a unified board. To me, it's like carrying out the hanging before you get the result of your appeal. Well, we don't say you have to merge. We say that you have to elect that first board, and that board has the authority to give you the delay. Yeah. And that's your people that you will elect. And to me, that muddies the water, because then you're still got a divided process that you're trying to follow. We're, we're trying to focus on two separate paths right now. We're trying to focus on an individual um, you know, budget for our school as if we were going, if we have a chance to win the lawsuit. So that's part of our focus. Part of our focus is a merged budget. Uh, you're talking about uh, trying to prevent chaos by, by introducing, you know, I, I know that that's the argument that the uh, agency of has provided you is that there's chaos and we need to just move forward to, to finish that. I'm here to tell you that if you push forward and don't give a, just a straight, clean delay for everyone that wants one, anyone that's in a forced merger that does not agree to that, I'm saying if you're in a forced merger and you want to go ahead and you're prepared to and all the entities within that district are good to go, more power to you. That's great. Um, that's what you want to do and go forward. If you're not in that situation and any one entity in that group does not want to move forward, then they should be allowed the time. Allow time for the court to, to make its decision. Allow time for um, the process to happen. And if we get an unfavorable decision, time to process that and time to move forward and implement this in a thoughtful way, not in a rushed, hasty way. We don't want to move forward with hastily prepared budgets that yep. are not well thought out. We don't want to move forward with uh, <coughs> articles of agreement that have been forced on us because we did not have a chance to go over those articles and uh, change those into ways that work for our communities. And uh, getting back to that whole process, community outreach. We're going to need yep. to be able to spend a lot of time healing our communities and discussing with them and getting them on board so that we can move forward in a productive way. And so, um, just to take it in two parts. So this bill that we're working on reflects agreement with you that you need more time. So if you took this delay, you'd have between now and July and then an additional year. So um, I don't know what that is, 18 months or something, good amount of time. So it seems like our, our remaining disagreement is whether the state should just grant that or whether the state should um, try somehow to be moving communities to a place where next year we won't have people say, honestly, we don't have time to merge, right? So my concern is twofold. One is to make sure you have the time you need. And the other is to make sure that next year you don't sit in the chair and say, honestly, we can't do it by July 1st. So what this bill tries to do is ask communities to take a couple of steps, and then if you win your case, then you can just disband that first merged board, and no harm, no foul. If you lose your case, and it's clear you're going to have to present a merged budget, you've got a board in place to begin work on that. I, I would vote or flip that around. I understand yeah. we're, we're, we're really close to the same place. Yeah. Our disagreement is around the, the steps you have to take to, to qualify for that. Yes. Um, on my view of that, just for conversation's sake, if you grant the one year delay and we get to that point, there's no harm, no foul. If, if we get an unfavorable decision and we have to move forward, we've been in full compliance with the law for maybe. You mean if your initial board decided not to take a delay? No, I, I'm saying if we get an unfavorable decision oh, in the on court. legal challenge. Yeah and we're required to move forward, then we would do that. I mean, we've, we've okay. taken every step. In which case, need. you would have a board ready to go. Uh, it, it, the matter of having a board ready to go is not a major hurdle. That's an organizational meeting and, and okay. submission of petitions. But so if it's not a major hurdle, what are we arguing about? The, the fact that you're requiring us to take that step before we're legally required to. And, and, and I think had our, that's, our day that's what it comes down to, I think. Ultimately, um, I understand that there's this feeling that if the state says, you know, I'm going to get up and get in my car and go to work, but if the state tells me to get up and get in my car to go to work, I don't like it, right? Because I want to feel free in my life. And 
generally, we try our best in this building to never tell people what to do if we can avoid it. I know it doesn't seem that way. But in this case, we, we had catastrophic demographic problems that we're dealing with. And so over the course of a decade, we've been trying to figure out a way to do this. So unfortunately, we're at a point where it's, it's now moved into the courts. The courts do not seem to be looking favorably on challenges to it. Okay, so it reminds me of the Brigham decision. That's un understood. But, but all I'm saying is I really don't think there's any, granted, it's a, it's a step that you would be required to take. But once you've elected that board, your elected people are going to decide whether to take the delay or not. After that, they could table any further action. And, and then if the decision goes in your favor, they can have a meeting and disband. And I, I can't see how that harms anybody. On the other hand, what does it do in terms of having you queued up and ready to go if you do have to merge? Then you have elected representatives <coughs> who can speak for your interests in creating that budget. I think the biggest issue and the yeah. reason why we were hesitant to that is the distrust uh, mm -hmm. around the AGS process. We don't feel like we've had a fair shake, which has caused us to lose our faith okay. in the entire process, the whole process. Um, so requiring us to take these additional steps just to grant us a delay feels like it's more of a just usher them further yeah. down the chute so that it's harder for them to get back out. Let me ask you this. How do you feel about the House bill? The House bill, um, I think, again, you're opening a can of worms because you had people that felt they had to present a 706 study uh, and brought it to the voters. And even if it was voted down, these folks are not eligible for a delay uh, according to that. Right. I think that's unfair because there were the community spoke. And they, they were presenting something that they felt was a normal procedure. And I don't think yeah. that it was. I, I agree with you. Uh, this committee agreed. Um, I, I think just a clean delay of one year yeah. without conditions. Well, I, I understand to, to you and people who are testifying similarly, it seems like clean is clear. But there are other people who believe that no delay should be given. And for those people, it seems like the state is, in, in that case, just abandoning the process. Now, now are those people in this room or are those people well, uh, in other communities that have voted? Can, can we clarify I'm, someone? I would say that there are, uh, on the map, there are plenty of communities that feel that way. So if they have voted and they have merged and they are together and enjoying the, the benefits that have been promised to them, then what harm does it cause them if you grant a delay to the other people that are waiting to get this sorted out? All, all I'm saying is that this bill is attempting to square a circle, find a, a middle ground. It's not going to make people on either side of the, the furthest sides happy. What I'm trying to do is make it equitable to the extent possible, get people their delay, and satisfy at least a little bit the uh, urge to prepare to move a budget forward. So, Bob, the question I have, and, and we've talked about this for a while, obviously, and the frustration I have, but to ultimately move to get you any kind of delay or to get any of these schools any kind of delay, there has to be a compromise. Would you guys rather see something like what the language is in um, what Senator Bruce has proposed or nothing at all? I mean, that's kind of, I think, you know, Andy and I are, are, are with you guys 100%, but I, again, we, we work with numbers, too. We have to figure out how do we move something through the building. and. And I think the reality for us is um, this is the best, honestly, iteration we've seen. Not that there can't be adjustments made around over the next couple of days, but what would you rather see a student? Nothing at all, or to give you that that delay? It's hard to say. I really feel that as we move further down that process, well, it becomes and and it's still your option because right. under this bill, if you don't want to elect that initial board, you don't have to. But what what would happen is. You would be expected to merge by July 1st, 19. And if you didn't, there's a provision that creates a default budget for you because you're essentially saying, we're, we're not going to do anything. At that point, AOE would create your budget. So I think the other path, which this bill provides, a very <coughs> modest step. You vote for your year delay, and then you are fully legally allowed to not do anything until you figure out what's going on with your portraits. Well, I understand that you guys have to deal with compromises. I yeah. get that. Um, 
but from everyone I've seen sitting at this end of the table yep. so far today, nobody is on board with that compromise. Okay. Um, so well, the house the house bill is a possibility, and that maybe we'll mm -hmm. we'll wind up in a conference probably with the Senate, and that is a possibility. So, if people would prefer the house bill. So if you're from Brattleboro, that would mean you get no delay. If you're from Orleans, that would mean you get no delay. There's a whole list of people who would get no delay. That could still happen. I, I, if I were you, I'd be pulling for us to pass this bill because it's much more sympathetic to your interests, I think, if you pull back. I, I understand. Uh, and I was just going to say, I, I understand what your views to further down the shoot analogy came from uh, town that had a large slaughter facility, I understand that and, uh, a metaphor, but I, so the metaphor I was thinking is like we're asking you to take a couple steps to what you see as a cliff and you don't want to, you don't want to take two steps to get towards the cliff, even if we're saying take two steps to get to the cliff uh, to get this delay. But as Corey said, this isn't kind of what we're dealing with. We don't, we don't want to push you towards the cliff, but we're but we're trying to get something because the option really is this house bill, nothing, which puts you in a fight with AOE come July 1st, which is fine. But that's kind of uh, what we're trying to figure out is like what's, what's the best of, the, of a bad situation. And I, I really have enjoyed, honestly, I've enjoyed talking <laughs> with you, but we have, we have to have the other witnesses. I, I get it. So I let me just close with I, I hope that you guys push forward with a, a delay option. Yep. And I want to echo everyone else that sat at this table and urge you to consider some sort of process to review the Section 9 proposals on the merits because I assure you, yeah. coming from the being on the ground, that was not done. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Cheryl Charles. Thank you. Waited very patiently. Oh, as are all of you. Uh, I'll get out my testimony and share it with you. But, Honorable Chair Ruth and members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here. So I'll pass that around. That's my testimony. And in addition, this is a summary of our section time of alternative comments. I'll introduce myself. I'll work with uh, the testimony that you're being provided. I won't read all of it. I will attempt to summarize it uh, as I move along through. Sure. Absolutely. I urge you to read it all. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a member of the school board in Westminster. I've been in that role. This is my fourth year. I'm also a member of the board of the Wyndham Northeast Supervisory Union. When you look at the map that you guys have been considering, we're down here in all of that sea of gray. I got it. Wyndham Northeast includes the white box, which is Rockingham. Okay. And then the three boxes of us in gray are those being asked to merge. The southernmost three. Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. West and south. Yep. Right, like that. I am an educator by background. I um, started as a high school teacher of American government and American history, as a, as a by the way. But I've worked K-12 and actually pre-K pre through 12th grade. Um, actually, I have a PhD in curriculum instruction, so my background is all about education. We've heard actually not from you all, but from some others, some criticism of some of the local boards as not being well prepared, informed, all of that. Two of the five of us on the Westminster board do have PhDs in education. The other three are engaged and informed and dedicated, and they are parents of children currently in our schools. So just to give you that uh, perspective. I've worked for decades nationally and internationally to try to improve the quality of education for children, for families, for communities, and actually with concern for the environment that supports us all too. So that's just a bit about my background. And my grandson, who's six years old, is now in kindergarten at the Westminster Center School. And his little sister is right behind. So she'll be here soon. Consistent with the last number of people you've heard from, I will state clearly that I'm opposed to this uh, forced merger, as are um, most of the members of our town, as well as the members of our school board. We're a unified board. Actually, we're a unified supervisory union. So 
we believe that only a delay will allow time for the court to act. And I know that you all are in support of the delay. I mean, from what I hear, so I appreciate that fully. But we, we believe that a delay is necessary to allow time for the court to act and for our boards and our communities to embrace the court's decision, whatever it ends up being in the end. We have been very supportive of this process throughout, and we will continue to be. We uh, did go through um, the, the full process. I'm skipping quite a few sections here. But as a community, as boards, again, throughout our supervisory agreement, we strongly support the goals of Act 46. And we have every step of the way. I've been a member of the Westminster School Board throughout this process. Um, I worked on the study committee. I was a member of that. So I helped prepare the articles that we took to our four towns for a vote. When we took the articles of agreement to our town, three out of the four towns resoundingly defeated them. 74% defeated that vote in Westminster. Overall, the sum of all the voters in the four towns, 62% of all voters rejected the merger. We therefore looked at the law, because I can't stress how much we have read the law and reread the law and looked at the opportunity through the Section 9 the Alternative Government Structure Proposal, took it really, really seriously. And we thought that the law meant what it said there, that we could thoughtfully prepare uh, our case to be uh, in an alternative. Please know that we were not trying to protect the status quo. We were not digging in our heels to resist change that would improve the lives of our children. We sincerely worked together as representatives of the four towns to find new and effective ways to make improvements, and we continue to do so with increased efficiency, transparency, accountability, and program changes that allow for even more cooperation to bring high quality services and equitable educational opportunities to children in all four towns. So we developed, obviously, what we think was an outstanding alternative governance proposal. We submitted it in a timely manner. We met with then Superintendent, uh, Secretary of Education, Rebecca Holcomb, and staff. We were pleased then that the acting Secretary's report of findings did not recommend a forced merger for our towns. We presented to the State Board of Education on two occasions. We have representatives from all of our towns there, all of us, you know, united as I'm making this point. And we got no serious questions really about the merit of our alternative governance proposal. Uh, and then we were stunned to see the results of the November 28th ruling that three of our four towns would be forced to merge, creating one much smaller school district rather than our current highly efficient and effective supervisory union of would four this, towns. Would the supervisory union go away? If, there, if you have the merger, wouldn't they ask you to stay? That's not, it's not clear to us okay. what's going to be the consequence of that. It's not clear. Okay, yeah. fair enough. So, you know, voters in Athens, Grafton, and Westminster, who overwhelmingly, you know, they were, we were the three, three of the four towns that decisively voted against the merger. Um, and we kept saying, you know, the law asked for us to vote. The law made no mention that no votes wouldn't be considered or were unacceptable. So to us, it makes no sense to ignore the will of voters. And we think it subsequently erodes trust in how our elected officials and the government system works overall. Part of the rationale offered to us by the State Board's action in November was that we'd all, we, we had gone through all the steps, that we had a study committee, a vote of the people. We then um, developed our alternative governance to this, uh, proposal, thereby suggesting, this is the board, that we were ready for a merger of three of the four towns. But our voters never voted on a possible merger of Athens, Rector, and Westminster. We voted on a possible merger of the four towns and our own school. So the forced merger of our three small town schools will result in a new school district of only about 250 students. Whereas our alternative governance proposal for the four towns and our high school brings us to 900 or more. <coughs> I want you to consider that. We don't see how the forced merger benefits children or taxpayers. 
and the previous speakers talked a little bit about indebtedness, but that's an issue we're facing uh, as well. We have different levels of indebtedness and the three towns being forced to merge. Westminster carries a debt because we built a new high school, a gymnasium, some years ago. Athens and Grafton do not. They have far lower uh, tax rates than mm -hmm. we do. And, and, I, and I just want to repeat, because I, I, it's natural, but um, I, I feel as though the bulk of the testimony we're getting today is about people feeling as though the order is unfair to merge, and it should have been done differently, and that's really not what we're considering. You're welcome to spend your time that way. I, I would be very interested to know what you think of the bill we're considering and whether that would help you or... Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, my spirit around this, though, was to give you, I thought, perhaps some information you didn't have yeah. in this, in your deliberation process. Yep. Part of the State Board's decision suggested that we would be well prepared to develop a consolidated budget for the three towns. And I want to address some reasons that that's not the case right now. Um, one of them is because of the interconnectedness between our supervisory union budget, our local budgets, and the state's accounting system. The Westminster School Board, we work as a committee of the whole on our budget, so we start early and we work for many months to prepare for presenting um, our budget to the, to the town meeting in, the, in March. All of the school systems, I'm sure you know this, but all the school systems in Vermont are being asked to prepare for a new accounting system, a new accounting system. Westminster, actually our whole supervisory union, volunteered to be among the few towns that participated in a pilot that's going on right now. We were one of three towns that went live on, or three communities that went live January 1, 2019. The process is not going smoothly. We have a really experienced long-term business manager and team, and they are having to create and maintain two sets of books in the process because they're being asked to create a new chart of accounts and a new payroll system, and it's not all in place. So they're struggling, but they're doing it. They're very good. Add to that that the state has a new data gathering and data analysis system to determine the number of equalized pupils in a district. We, working with our business manager for the months of the process of developing the budget, kept getting different numbers from the state. And as late as the Friday afternoon, March 1st, before our town meeting on March 2nd, we got new numbers, literally, the afternoon before we were moving into town meeting. So that um, has us not have all the confidence in the world that we would like to have in working with our partners uh, at the state level. So we think that if for no other reason than to verify the numbers in the system, if we're being asked to develop budgets and consolidated budgets, and if you're putting in numbers that are erroneous, it makes no sense that we're going to get a quality uh, product out of all of this. So we, we again, we request the delay for many reasons, but this is one of the reasons that we think that any forced merger should be pushed out to 2020 to let the courts work on this process. And we think that that will be a delay, and I, again, I think the settlement is to agree with a delay, that that will be a much less chaotic process. It will mm -hmm. let us thoughtfully respond to what the courts decide, and we'll continue to work together uh, as our talents I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Let me ask you if you could just quickly speak mm -hmm. to the logic of the House bill. So the House bill said, the, the, so there's all these communities that want to delay, mm -hmm. half get it, mm -hmm. based on the fact that they set up at one point a study committee or brought a proposal to their voters. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to just react to that? Because Brattleboro was one that was not given a delay. So and was, we were not either. Yeah. Right. So, sorry, yes, um, you were not either, mm -hmm. and the, the logic was that you were further down the path and you could do it in ways that communities who hadn't done those things couldn't. Right. Do you want to quickly speak to that? We don't agree with the logic. Okay. We think we need more time. And one example is the problem with the, the 
state budget system yeah. right now, in a, yeah. interacting with ours. How about local. how about specifically the the thinking that because you had a study committee, because you produced a proposal, you were further along and readier. Well, that was a uh, that was a proposal for four towns in a supervisory mm -hmm. union, not these three towns. Yep. With you know lower tax rates in two of the three, and actually perhaps one of the lowest poverty levels in the state in Athens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's and that's not what we worked on. We didn't okay. know. So that does that logic doesn't work for me. All right. I I thought you would say that. Yeah. Um, we, as a committee, we felt the same way. Mm -hmm. Thank um, you. So our intention was to try to get you what, what you have very carefully argued for, which is the need for more time. Right. Um, how do you feel about the idea of electing uh, that first initial board to make the decision about whether to delay? We, too, would prefer not to go that way. Yep. No surprise to you. We appreciate your efforts. We'd just rather not even step into that until Under, the courts have decided. Is there a reason other than just we'd rather not take a step? Is there is there a practical reason? We think it adds more confusion right now. You know, we're in negotiations with, with just literally toward the end of negotiations mm -hmm. with teachers. I'll be on the negotiation team with staff. You know, those will be commitments from our district mm -hmm. that it stands now. Um, and that, that would continue, of course. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, it, it, it just seems more elegant, more fair yeah. okay. not to do that. Fair enough. Um, any questions? Thank you so much. I appreciate that you you. you came all the way and you, and you waited a long time. I have one more document to give you. My okay. colleague, um, Jack Breyer, is on the Grafton School Board. And he submitted his testimony in, in writing. Is not here, but I just we'll want to give it to you as well. Thank you. My pleasure. So much. Uh, Sonia Spalding. Please, hey, join us. I'm sorry. I understood. Yep. Yeah. One of the reasons why I was trying to move it along is that we will tend to lose senators as we get later, so. Sorry. What's that? Is there extra genie ones in there? Uh, there. I believe you might be the only person today to argue for no delay. Well, I'm feeling no. a little bit want? like a, an underdog sitting okay. there, but I'm going to give you my right. my argument. Let's do it. Um, and as I, I apologize, I'm going to read mine because I don't want to forget anything. I Please. spend some time on this. So, my name is Sonia Spalding, and I serve as the board chair in Barry City, and I've been on the Barry City Elementary and Middle School Board for the last eight years. I provided a testimony to the House Education Committee back in January, and I also sent an email to all of you regarding my position on delaying the implementation of Act 46, and I want to thank you for allowing me to, test it, for, to present my testimony in person. So although our district falls under the umbrella of a forced merger, our community supports being merged and following the timeline as outlined in Act 46. This is evident from the fact that the voters of the city of Barrie have supported the merger in two separate votes, the first in November 2016 and the second in November 2018. In addition to the support of the voters of Barrie City, it is important to take into consideration the number of voters in Barrie Town that also voted in favor of a merger. Over the course of the last two votes in both communities and the re-votes in Barrie Town, the majority of voters actually voted in favor of a merger. And I've included a table at the end. Yep. Um, most importantly, I would note that in the last re-vote in Barrie Town, more people voted to merge than not to merge, but there were not enough votes to overturn the original results of the yeah. vote in November. Yeah. One of the most unfortunate consequences of this final result is that we didn't get any of the incentive money. It has been frustrating that even though Barrie City has been on board from the start, we are only one part of the equation. We will continue to move forward regardless and hope that as our communities are healing these wounds, we can all find common ground. While I recognize that there are some communities that feel that they need more time, that is not the case for us. Even with the defeated vote and revotes, our supervisory union has been slowly moving forward with the possibility that we may be forced to merge, knowing that we may have a small window of time to accomplish that merger. 
Our understanding of the law led us to believe that we, that we would be forced to merge. The State Board of Education's decision in November confirmed that to be true. After that decision, we moved forward with a transitional board, which has already held a vote to amend the default articles of agreement. We have warned an election for April with a slate of candidates for the new board of the Barry Unified Union School District. We are reviewing a draft of a consolidated budget and are working toward the consolidation of policies. We hope the new board will warn our first consolidated budget vote for May. At this point, it will take more time and energy to undo the consolidation work that has already taken place if we have to delay, specifically with, gar with regards to our consolidated budget. It will also delay the inevitable outcome of merging our districts with no benefits to our students or our communities. I also understand that some districts may be struggling to comply with the law as it was written, but I ask you to take into consideration that all of us have had the last four years to pre prepare for this. By delaying the implementation of these forced mergers, you are suggesting that some districts need special treatment, while the majority of districts have gone through the process of voluntary merger or in the process of complying with the constraints of a forced merger. You are also suggesting that some districts can continue to delay the intended efficiencies of Act 46, which includes larger economies of scale and cooperation. This may be the most important piece of the puzzle, in my opinion, since I believe we can all recognize that every school budget has an impact on every other district and budget in the state. When the Joint Fiscal Office recently recommended a change to the projected yield amount due to the increase in FY20 budgets across the state, that impacts all of us. Our consolidated budget that has not been finalized or presented to voters yet will have an additional one or two cents added to the tax rate without us adding a dime to the overall spending due to the budgets of every other district. We all need Act 46 to be implemented without delay so we can all reap the benefits. I have also seen that there is some discussion in this committee about a compromise that allows new boards to decide for themselves whether they should delay or not. In all honesty, this seems like another abdication of your responsibility. The Vermont Legislature passed Act 46 and pushed the very difficult task of forcing mergers, forcing districts to merge to the State Board of Education. It seems like you're trying to punt again and pass the tough decisions off to the new boards. While you recognize you can't make everyone happy, you need to do what is best and right for our students and our taxpayers. We continue to hear about rising costs and education spending, but we have yet to have a full year of every district following Act 46. While our districts may meet many of the goals of Act 46, including some of the lowest per people spending in the state, I believe that with every district moving toward consolidation and efficiency, we can start to see res results. And I ask you, wasn't that one of the main reasons that this law was enacted in the first place? When making your decision, I hope you recognize that the public education system in Vermont has been a political lightning rod for at least the past eight years. Some of the new initiatives and laws that come to mind that I have lived through um, include the consolidation of special education and transportation under the supervisory union umbrella, universal pre-K, proficiency-based graduation requirements, flexible pathways, and most recently, Act 173 that addresses special education services and funding. In addition, our business office is in the process of the mandated switch to a unified chart of accounts and the statewide school district data management system. Our schools and the business of running our schools has been constantly under some mandate or change for many years. All of these laws and mandates have the very best of intentions for the students and taxpayers. Each one hopes to address either inequities, rising costs, or the quality of education for our students. The same can be said of Act 46. With this in mind, I ask that you please recognize that we need to keep moving forward. We have too much work to do to spend the time and energy undoing the work that we've already done. Please do what is best for our students and what is best for our taxpayers. Do what is best for our communities. Please be clear and decisive and do not push this decision to the new board or just push it off another year. Let us continue to move forward together. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that's a perspective we haven't heard today. Um, if I could just ask you, so kudos to your districts for moving forward on the process in, in, a, in a very methodical way. I think that's great. Um, nothing in this bill would force you to take a delay. You could obviously you could continue on your same path. Is it a worry that the newly elected board might decide to take a delay because it's an option? Yes. Okay. I think um, if I look at the slate of candidates, I think the um, you know it's unknown who will be elected because yeah. there are some contested races. 
Um, and Barry, the, the, the candidates for Barry City, I think, are primarily in favor. But there are some candidates <coughs> in Barry Town who are not. And so depending on the makeup of that board, we yep. could be faced once again with Barry City versus Barry Town. Yep. And it just becomes very sticky because you know we're continuing to move forward and mm -hmm. that could just you know well, I have to say Barry has been something that I, I won't speak for others but I I have thought a lot about your situation when I've talked to um, Jeff Francis and Nicole Mace um, they talk about Barry as a community who has been doing great work that they don't want to see um, bumped off the track and I, I have thought a lot about that I can't see a way other than naming Barry, literally, in the, we, which we sometimes do in certain circumstances, other than naming Barry and saying, you don't get a delay in, under any circumstances, keep going, I can't see a way to provide the other communities that need their delay. We looked for ways to create a category of people that obviously didn't need the delay or shouldn't have the delay, and we just couldn't find a logical way to do that. So. I suppose if, if I take myself as the person who mostly drafted that legislation, what I was thinking was that newly elected merged board, which you've already warned uh, that election, which is great, that, that body is going to be a representative body. And they're going to represent the will of the people. If the will of the people is to take another year to do it, unfortunately, in, in your case, Maybe that will delay things, but it will be because of that local democratic vote. Um, and the other people will also take their democratic votes, and most of them, I think, judging from today, will be glad to have that board represent them in asking for a delay. But the idea is to, as much as possible, stay with the democratic process that's outlined in the default articles. And to be true to our word, once that merged board is elected, it's empowered, and it has the ability to, to make the choice. I, I, I hear you that they might make a choice that you feel would set the work back, but it would be the choice of representative elected officials speaking on behalf of the communities. So my concern with um, pushing the decision to an elected board yeah. is that the people in this, you know, in our case, our candidates have already submitted petitions and we have a slate of candidates and, and absentee ballots are going out in the mail, I think, mm -hmm. next week. So, but that's not to say that there couldn't be a write-in campaign. And I'm concerned about people who only have this one mm -hmm. position in mind and have no experience or concern about how to run a school or the best. I know. I, I'm, that, those are my concerns. And every, every elected official in here, and I'll, I'll just look at the senators, this happens all the time. You get, you get people who run on one issue for Senate, for House, for school board, for city council, because there's a, a scum plant on the river and they want to close it down. Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm the anti-scum plant person. And people will run saying, I'm the anti-merger person. And that's how democracy works. Some people will run and say, I'm going to be the candidate who does the thoughtful thing and gets us through this tough transition. And I'm going to continue on the road to completing, uh, you know, to completing our merger work by May or June. And, and the, voters will, the voters will pick. And, are they, you know, yeah, yeah. Are they all at large? There's one. There's one seat that's at large, and there's four in Barry City and four in Barry Town. Yeah. The House oh. version uh, doesn't take away. Right. Yeah. And and I know that the House thought a lot about it and credited your situation and wanted to make sure that that you could move through. Ours is ours is dicier because we are. Devolving some of that decision to the to the local merge board. Barry is it small enough to get the small school grant? No. So only if we have another incentive. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so I, much. I appreciate your um, the willingness to to come. So I believe we have two more witnesses. It's um, uh, actually three because we have a witness on another topic. Um, so like coffee.
But John Pendleton. Yes. Good afternoon. Barry again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so some of what you will hear will parallel some of what Sonia said. Her perspective is as a school board member and my perspective in speaking about Barry is as a superintendent. Um, and I'll pick up, I think, a few to address a few of the things sure. that you brought up in your discussion just now. So um, my name is John Pandolfo. I am the superintendent of the Barry Supervisory Union. Um, and I'm going to start just by saying thank you for hearing my testimony on behalf of the Barry Supervisory Union, but also as a resident of the Washington Central Supervisory Union and as a member of the Vermont School Boards Association. So I'll begin by speaking as the superintendent of the Barry Supervisory Union. Um, in preparation for today, I reviewed the testimony I provided to the House Ed Committee on January 23rd of this year on H39, as well as what I provided in 2017 on various progress on Act 46. I felt that information provided then is relevant for today, so I attach it to today's testimony. As you're hopefully aware, Barry has been continuously engaged in efforts to implement Act 46 for more than three and a half years. While we did not succeed in achieving a voluntary merger, we have accepted the State Board of Education's order to merge and are actively and rapidly moving forward towards the July 1st, 2019 date to begin operation as the Barry Unified Union School District. We held one of the first organizational meetings in the state for our new union district on January 10th, just two days after our last, fair, our last failed voluntary merger reconsideration vote. We successfully voted to amend our default Articles of Agreement on February 19th and have warned elections for our new district board for April 9th. Both of those votes were warned by our transitional board and that board continues to develop our unified budget. We plan to hold our unified budget vote on May 14th. This work has been demanding on our boards and administration, but our understanding and belief is that this is what the law requires. In Barrie, we did not hold budget vote votes for our currently existing separate districts because the law states that these districts will cease to exist after June 30th, 2019, and we're following the law. Our three district boards did not vote to participate in any lawsuits. The five-member Barrie Town School Board voted three against and two for joining the large 33 district lawsuit. With a different board makeup, that might have turned out differently, but it turned out they voted not to join the lawsuit. The Barry City District Board and the Spalding Union District Board did not entertain a motion to vote, joining the, to, to vote on joining the lawsuit. Our focus is finally on moving forward, and any delay in going operational as a merged, merged district on July 1, 2019 will be extremely problematic for Barry. We're not prepared to continue operating as single districts. We do not have separate district budgets developed. We do not have separate budget votes warned. Several of our current district board members have committed to remain on these boards only for the short term. This is all based on how we understand the law. <clears throat> the petition deadline for the April 9th new district board election was this past Monday, March 11th. Petitions have been submitted for all nine seats, with two of the nine seats contested. Nine of the 11 candidates are current board members, and at least nine of the 11 candidates have stated they're in favor of moving forward as a large district. Right. However, any bill which contemplates a vote by this new board on a decision to delay operation of the new union district until July 2020 causes me great concern and, and my fear is it will impact our ability to govern this district in a culture of chaos and with single budgets not approved. We have a very real history over the past few years of effective negative campaigning leading to negative vote outcomes. These campaigns have included signs, robocalls, social media, and harassment of voters entering polling places. It is not unforeseeable that a write-in campaign could be mounted with people solely running again on a platform of delay. Turnout for yet another random vote date will not be high. We've seen that over and over already this spring. The members who submitted petitions are committed to running a newly merged district board. Those running on a delay platform would not necessarily be. And regardless of the outcome of the election, if it were, uh, it would likely rekindle the divisiveness that's really just begun to dissipate. Um, you had a previous comment to Sonia about, you know, would, you know, would there be a problem? Why would it be a problem if we just put it in the hands of the board to kind of have that vote and vote on moving forward in, in 2019 or delay in 2020? 
and my belief is really that would provide an avenue for that one issue candidate. Whereas what we currently have, again, are people who have, you know, certainly yep. demonstrated and expressed interest in, in, you know, moving forward as a merged district. So can I just clarify? So you have formed the transitional board, mm -hmm. and you've warned the the election for the initial board after amending the articles of agreement. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so you've you've formed the transitional board, amended the articles of agreement, and warned the new. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the petition deadline is passed. The petition deadline is passed. But again, with small turnout and organization, a slate of candidates could certainly run a ranking campaign. Mm -hmm. A delay has the potential for disaster and is absolutely not in the best interest of the children of Barry. Please don't open the door to that possibility. Barry is uh, finally starting to heal from the divisiveness of the past four years. We've just celebrated our first positive vote in the entire merger process, and we can't afford to go backwards. So next, I'd like to speak as a resident of East Montpelier, which is served by the Washington Central Supervisory Union. When I extend the thoughts above about Barry to Washington Central, as well as to the other systems under state board order to merge, I become even more concerned. These are systems that have struggled the most in the state when attempting to work together to make decisions towards merging. Why would you, at this point in time, put a decision like this back in their hands? The legislature has already made that decision in passing the law. The State Board of Education has already made the decision following the law on issuing orders to merge. A Superior Court judge has stated very strongly that he believes both of those decisions were justified and appropriate. There's no valid reason for you to thrust that decision back on these communities. It will continue to divide them. Um, I was at the Washington Central Organizational Meeting that was tabled on February 19th. Uh, I was witness to the acrimony at that meeting. And, you know, I am ashamed of the way members of my own Washington Central community have acted. I have little doubt that if you pass this bill and give a yet-to-be-warned, yet-to-be-petitioned, yet-to-be-elected new district board the decision to delay, you're going to have an election of acrimony and divisiveness where children's educational interests will take a back seat and a delayed platform may likely take the day. And you'll end up with the board of a new unified district that you may not have interest in running a newly unified district as a unified district, doing a great disservice to the children of my community and to the intent and goals of Act 46. And I think you'll see this repeated across the state. I acknowledge that this may sound overly dramatic, but I mean every word of it sincerely. Um, I stepped in as a new superintendent right after Act 46 passed. And for almost four years, I watched two school systems uh, both where I live and where I work, struggle as much as anywhere in the state. Um, it is time to put this behind us and to move on. More delay will only continue the acrimony and dysfunction, and it will be bad for our children and for Vermont. Lastly, I'll speak on behalf of the Vermont Superintendents Association. In doing so, I simply want to say that superintendents, central office staff, and building leaders too often are finding themselves contending with a political, and operational challenges associated with the prolonged implementation of Act 46. BSA's Executive Director Jeff Francis stays in very close communication with superintendents and does an effective job of representing the views of superintendents. For example, Jeff hosted a meeting of a number of su superintendents yesterday to gauge what we thought of the proposal to assign the decision for Act 46 delay back to newly constituted boards. I can say that these superintendents able to participate had significant concern, concerns about that potential action. Like me, these colleagues are working to implement the law, follow the directives of the Agency of Education, and doing their absolute best to serve boards and communities that are often in conflict. In some cases, these leaders are being vilified for the role that they're playing in the Act 46 implementation process. In some cases, they are reluctant to speak out because of concerns about acrimony and dissension in the process. To a person, the superintendents, superintendents participating in the meeting had serious concerns about dynamics that will result in the delayed decision or if the delayed decision is placed on local boards. They also indicated that they are working towards being ready to have their newly unified districts operational on July 1, 2019, and believe their systems can be ready, barring any further delays in decision making here in the legislature. On one additional note, speaking again as the superintendent in Barry, um, member, members both of my board and my communities have asked that consideration be given 
to providing very the tax incentives under Act 46, as in the as in their final votes, both of our communities voted by majority to approve a voluntary merger. As Sonia noted in the last reconsideration vote, it was a majority vote, but it didn't exceed the threshold for um, passing. And you had asked earlier, you don't really see a logical way to allow Barry to not be part of the delay if everyone else was. Well, we may be the only system that is under a forced merger that actually had a positive vote in all of our communities. In the end, a majority vote to you, you mean that merge. didn't make the additional burden for the revote? Correct. I, I'm not so sure that's true. I think there were a couple of other communities where that happened. I'd have to ask Don Ruzzi. Yeah, not so that I'm aware of, but it's possible. Yeah. Certainly, I don't have every yeah. detail. Okay, so so noted. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to. I just wanted to say to people in the room, if you if you wondered where are these other people who feel mm -hmm. that there should be no delay, I thought you the last two witnesses just made a very eloquent case, um, and this is the the essential paradox that the committee's been dealing with. You can turn one way and argue it, you know, right to the merits all the way down, and you can turn the other way and you can do the same thing. The committee has to move forward with a House bill that gave half, of the, half the communities a delay on a rationale we didn't agree with, but at the same time, we don't want to, if we can help it, we don't want to stop progress. So this draft tries to get everybody to make the, to, Everybody to be where you are at, pretty much. Um, and Stowe, we had in, and I said the same thing. It's, it's really to move people to that level where you and Stowe are at, where you can see that it could be done in a year, um, in your case, in six months. Um, questions for the, for the witness? Thanks, John. Thank you for coming. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so rather than take questions from the audience. We're coming up on 5 o'clock. Who's the compromise for them? Rather than take comments from the audience, <laughs> I will uh, ask Neil O'Dell. Last witness. Excuse me. Thank you for... Uh, thank, thank you for waiting all the way to the uh, end of the list. A long, uh, yeah. long afternoon. Um, so thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is uh, Neil O'Dell. I am the Vice President of the uh, Vermont School Board Association, uh, Board of Directors. I am joined today by Ford B.S. Smith, who is also on the Board of Directors, and uh, Paul Mace as well, Executive Director of the Vermont School Board Association. Um, and before I share with you the Board's position on, on House Bill 39, I would like to start with our organization's mission and vision because I think it will set the context for, for the later testimony. Uh, vision, the Vermont School Words Association envisions a state where every student has access to and is engaged in a world-class education, where local boards provide student-focused oversight of education systems, and where educators, families, and communities are engaged partners, ensuring that the futures of all Vermont children are driven by their aspirations, not bound by their circumstances. Our mission. The VSBA works to achieve our vision for public education by supporting local and supervisory union boards to be effective trustees of their communities and by providing a strong collective voice towards enhancing the cause of public education in Vermont. The VSBA has a 24 member board of directors, a president, immediate past president, and 22 regional representatives, two representatives elected by school board members from each of 11 regions throughout the state. The VSBA is governed by bylaws, resolutions, and policies. In the absence of a resolution on a particular topic, the VSBA board provides guidance to the organization and the staff. Acts 46 and 49 have been challenging for school boards in all of Vermont. Many districts have merged, some have not. Some mergers went smoothly, some did not. Some tried and failed, some tried, failed, tried again, and then passed. Some want a delay, some do not. Some believe the law is unconstitutional and have joined a lawsuit. Others have not challenged the law. In summary, this has been a very challenging item for the VSBA. Previous positions on Act 46 and 49 had served the organization well. 
We were neither in favor of nor opposed to school district consolidation. We did, however, remain engaged in the process, offering testimony on a variety of different aspects of bills as they were being crafted. We have found this current environment, particularly on the issue of delay, to be quite different. In an effort to be as inclusive as possible, the organization originally adopted a similar position on delay. We were neither in favor of nor opposed to delay, but we did want to remain a part of the discussion. Unfortunately, that position has been parsed differently by different constituents as the conversation of delay has escalated. Some interpreted any testimony provided by the VSBA as a stance in favor of delay. Recent attempts to clarify our position proved unsuccessful. Our attempts to capture and reflect the wide and disparate views on this issue failed. Last night, the VSBA Board of Directors met and reviewed the Senate Education Committee amendment to H39, considered the testimony offered by the Agency of Education and the opinion of Judge Mello, and for over two hours, discussed the experiences with Act 46 implementation in their regions. While many points of view emerged, the board also reflected on the organization's mission and vision, in addition to best practice in school district governance, and concluded that taking a position at this time is the right thing to do. The board adopted the following motion. The VSBA recognizes that this is a challenging time for boards, and our membership <coughs> is divided on the issue. Our mission and vision statements require us to support policies that promote good governance, to prolong the uncertainty regarding Acts 46 and 49 will have a detrimental effect on students and employees. Therefore, we oppose delay, we support default budgets, the legislature should decide on delay, not individual school districts. And if there is a delay, the legislature should also reaffirm the State Board of Education's merger plan. The board's discussion last night highlighted the following concerns. We are deeply concerned about the effect that delay will have on children. Public education has an ambitious mission which is expanding every year with initiatives intended to better respond to the needs of struggling students, Act 173, to provide safe and healthy environments, S40, and to ensure all children feel safe and welcome in schools, H3. School officials cannot focus on the critical needs of students and support the employees who directly work with students if they're consumed with disputes over school governance. We are concerned that the recent acts of civil disobedience among board members and community members sets a dangerous precedent for the governance of school districts. The role of a school board is to serve as effective trustees on behalf of the community by ensuring the district complies with the law, adopting a budget that meets the educational needs of students, adopting district policy and procedure, and operating ethically and effectively. <coughs> Current news coverage and the experiences of our own members shared at board meetings makes clear that in many of these communities, good governance is at risk, placing the students and employees of those schools at risk. A delay of Acts 46 and 49 rewards these acts of civil disobedience and sends a message to school officials that failure to follow the law <coughs> may be rewarded with relief from the law. We are concerned that delaying Acts 46 and 49 will be interpreted by community members in recently unified districts that the General Assembly may be backing off of its intent to fully implement the law. We are already hearing from some community members that believe a delay means the law will be repealed and it is reigniting debates in communities that already unified about whether that was the right thing to do. The General Assembly passed Acts 46 and 49. It is the General Assembly's job to see the law fully implemented and on schedule. 
do not defer decisions regarding delay to local <coughs> communities that have been engaged in contentious discussions about the law for over four years. School boards across the state have carried out the law as you wrote it. They are relying on you to ensure it is fully implemented, not to defer difficult decisions about when to implement to communities that are divided on the issue. The General Assembly passed Act 46 four years ago in order to respond to concerns about the sustainability of our public education system. The types of changes and opportunities contemplated by Act 46 have required school board members to navigate some of the most challenging and pressing issues facing public education today. In large measure, Vermont's school board members have risen to the challenges posed by declining enrollment, rising cost leadership turnover, and growing inequity in student opportunity, and are charting a positive course forward for public education in Vermont. This course builds upon our strengths, but recognizes that preserving the status quo is not in the best interests of the students and the communities we serve. The VSBA Board of Directors recognizes this position <coughs> is not shared by all members. But we are an organization that is deeply committed to great governance, excellent education, and strong communities. We call on the General Assembly to first and foremost consider the needs of students and the health and well-being of our public education system as you consider your amendment to H39. Thank you very much, and I, I know that it was very difficult for you to take a position that your members have been up many minds about it, um, so I appreciate that as guidance for us in terms of thinking about your organization. Thank you. Are you, are you on the new Norwich school board? I am. Uh, what happened with Norwich through Act 46? Did you guys you have experience with mergers, or what, what would you guys end up doing? Uh, Norwich, being uh, an interstate school district, was excluded from the Act 46 discussions. However, I will say, despite the fact that we were excluded, I did reach out to neighboring school boards in the area that were impacted by Act 46, and we did get together. And we talked with Sharon and Stratford and Thetford on numerous occasions. Um, uh, Representatives Maslin and Briglin joined those conversations because, you know, like many school districts, I, the goal was to improve public education in the state of Vermont. And I didn't feel that it was right just because we were an interstate school district to automatically exclude ourselves from that discussion. Mm -hmm. And if there were benefits that were available to my kids in my school district, it made sense for me to have those discussions, even if I wasn't required to. And you guys, did you find any benefits in those discussions? Those benefits were unsuccessful. But it's not the benefits, sorry. The discussions were unsuccessful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, those other school districts were compelled to do something. And uh, at the end of the day, I didn't think that it was appropriate for Norwich to stand in the way to make the difficult decisions more difficult for them. But we talked for several months. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And for everyone who came today, thank you. Um, I hope if, if one thing happens today, when you leave the room, I hope you won't forget that you were here and everybody listened for a number of hours to what you had to say. Doesn't mean we'll do exactly what you want, but I feel like too often people say we weren't listened to, and what they mean is we didn't get the result we wanted. But we're, we're doing our level best to listen to you and to try to understand and craft a policy out of that. So thanks for um, coming and sharing what you had to say. So we're, we're, we're going to have to now move to our other witness, which is on a different topic, not on Act 46, but on campus sexual assault. So, Thank you for coming.